I had just turned 20 in March of this year and started to get out more on my own. I was always shy. I never wanted to go out alone, but now I started to feel a bit more comfortable. I just ordered myself a pocket knife. I actually have a few now and would carry it with me most of the time when I went out on daily walks. This one time in June was the one time I was blessed to have thought of bringing my pocket knife with me. It was around 8 p.m. when I decided to go for a walk. Usually I would try to go in the morning or early afternoon, but it had been raining all day, so my walk was delayed. I put on a light hoodie and was about to head out when I realized my knife wasn't in my pocket. I went back up and got it, then was on my way. My usual walk is about 3-4 to four miles. I'm a faster walker, so I could cut the miles to about 2.5 hours max. I would take this side street to the main road that had a walkway about half a mile before it turned into a suburban area. Before you hit the suburban area, there was a path that cut through a forested area that had a few cabins and parks. As I made my way, I had noticed a figure hanging by a tree on the far side of one of the cabins. I took a quick glance at him and continued past him. For your insight, I'm a trans male and 5'1", so I would get mistaken a lot for a small 15 year old kid. As I made it to the end of the path, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that the man was now 15 feet away from me. This dude was pretty tall, at least 6'3". He was well built and was wearing torn jeans and a worn hoodie that seemed a bit too big for him. I began to speed up my walking as I turned a corner and shot a quick glance behind me. He was still behind me, just staring at me as he was making long strides towards me. At this point, I was beginning to freak out. He seemed to get closer with every step and I quickly took a hold of the knife from my pocket and had my finger on the flipper. The next part is burned into my memory for life. I felt a large hand grab my shoulder and pull me back. I have no clue how I managed to quickly whip around and flick open my knife and swipe towards his face in just a few seconds, though it felt like minutes. The man in the bleak of an eye jerked his face back, bringing up his hands as my knife sliced his palm. He let out a pained yell and fell back a few steps, clutching his hand. It felt like I had just scraped him, but his hand was already bloody and a small pool of blood was starting to form at his feet. He looked at me with anger filled eyes and then took off the other way. I stood there for a few minutes before realizing what just happened and I went home as fast as I could to call the police. I answered their questions and then they took the knife to get a blood sample of this dude. I was shaken from this experience and stayed with my brother for a few nights. A few weeks later the cops returned and told me that they found the guy and that he was wanted for sexual assault. I was shocked and happy that they found this bastard. My knife was also returned to me a few days later. My husband and I were at the supermarket and our baby was being especially fussy. So we took her out for a quick drive. The motion usually calms her down. It only took about 10 minutes to settle her. And I was still in the store but was unsure how much longer I would be and there's poor cell reception inside. He pulled back into the parking lot and waited for me. It was an unseasonably nice day, so he took her out of the car seat and sat her on one of the benches outside the store. He took a business call and had just sat down, absentmindedly rocking her in the carrier, when a woman, well-dressed, mid-30s, average height, fit build, approached him. It is not uncommon for people to ask to play with our baby, She's got big rosy cheeks, soft wisps of gold hair, and the most adorable toothless grin, especially when she's deep into a nap. But her nap schedule was paramount, so my husband was preparing to tell the woman she actually couldn't play with our baby right then. She walked over right in their direction, brimming with nonchalant confidence, and before he could even finish his sentence explaining that she was napping and not to be touched, she picked up the carrier and started walking off. He was in shock for a minute, not fully believing someone would be ballsy enough to do something so sinister in plain daylight. So he said, excuse me, put her down, as panic mounted. 
She remained calm the entire time, but when he called after her, she started walking away more briskly than when she approached. He ran full speed ahead and tried to grapple the carrier out of her hands, finally resulting to restraining her arms. The woman yells, help, he's trying to take my baby, kidnapping 911, help, kicking him in the shin and pulling a pink bottle of pepper spray out of her bag. Of course, no one in the parking lot was clocking their earlier interaction and assumed that he was really a kidnapper. A lone man in a Deadpool t-shirt versus a teeny well-dressed woman. Immediately, a man knocked my husband to the ground and was holding him down. He could hear bystanders encouraging the woman to file a police report, but she was doing a very convincing job of acting shooken up and insisted that she just wanted to get home. To make matters worse for my husband, she was driving a minivan. He was in a raw state of panic, realizing the entire parking lot had banded together to inadvertently facilitate the kidnapping of our daughter. He was begging and pleading with them, but no one was listening. They just kept screaming at him that the jig was up and he needed to lie still and wait for a police and stop terrorizing a young mother. My husband finally had the novel idea to show them family pictures on his phone. But too panicked to think clearly, this manifested as him shouting, I have pictures of that baby on my phone. Which of course, everyone interpreted as him having stocking photos, or worse, pornographic images of the baby. It was at this point that a man, I can't entirely blame this man considering what he thought was going on, kicked my husband as hard as he could in the ribs. It was at this point I was coming out of the store and I thought he was being robbed by these people. I was yelling for security, so panicked my chest constricted and I could barely get any sound out. It was only then I realized that he didn't have our baby with him. When I saw she was being held by a woman, I was relieved. I thought maybe the woman had intervened to move our daughter out of harm's way while my husband was being robbed and was walking away to get help. I couldn't find a security guard outside the store, so I ran up to people holding my husband down, waving my wallet, pleading, take everything you want. Just let him up and leave us alone. One of the men holding him down said something like, Lady, we need to wait for the police to deal with him. I was so confused. Why would muggers have called the police? I just kept stammering. What do you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And made out someone saying, He tried to abduct this woman's kid. I didn't understand and was sure I misheard him. My husband would never hurt a child and we have four kids. If he wanted to commit a crime, bringing home another kid would have been at the bottom of his list. I kept trying to understand what the man was saying, and suddenly, it all clicked. I looked around for the woman who had the baby carrier, and she was halfway across the parking lot. I went into total ballistic tiger cub mode, and literally leapt out on my heels. I sprinted across the parking lot. I'm not a UFC fighter, and I've never even taken a self-defense class. So all I could do was think to grab this woman by the hair and squeeze her throat with my other hand. Which didn't do much. She was getting away even as I grappled with her. Amazingly, none of the bystanders had yet connected that my husband was telling the truth and that this woman was fleeing with my baby. I yanked her as hard as I could and that was enough to make her drop the carrier. So I screamed. I was so scared and surprised that I actually threw myself on top of the carrier covering the entire thing like a blanket. I stayed that way without saying or doing anything else. The woman left. Not one person tried to stop her, even though she was clearly leaving without the child that she claimed was hers, which would be pretty damn incriminating if I watched the scene unfold. Within the next couple minutes, police had arrived. After all that, there were still several bystanders who explained it as my husband trying to kidnap a baby. The police, to my horror, assumed that she must not have had bad intentions. The first questions they asked me after getting the description of her weren't investigative. They were more questions thinly veiled, trying to convince me not to pursue charges, still placing the blame on my husband. A small sampling, do your husband and the baby look dissimilar? Is there a chance she thought he was abducting the baby and was trying to intervene? Could your husband have been doing something inappropriate or violent to the baby that would make her feel compelled to extract the baby from the situation? 
Did she seem groggy or confused? Could she have mistaken either of them as her own family members? They spent more time verifying that the baby was actually mine than they concerned themselves with the fact that the baby wasn't actually hers. My husband had called his brother at this point, who works in the office with a lot of lawyers and connected with one who gave us the priceless advice to get every officer's name and badge number to request copies of the store's security tapes right away and to escalate our complaint higher up the chain if these officers weren't taking us seriously. Finally, we had reason enough to believe we were being taken seriously and we went home. We were both shook and cried until we had got our other kids from school. My husband was seething with rage and grappling with a feeling of helplessness from how little he was able to do. He also had two cracked ribs from when the man kicked him. To the officer's credit, they did ask if he would like to press charges. Considering the man was generally convinced at the time that he was on the right side of intervening in a kidnapping and stayed to talk to the police and apologized profusely when the truth became clear, my husband declined to press charges. Amazing and frustrating, there were still people that stuck around to talk to the police who were giving my husband dirty looks and one man even implored the police to involve CPS to verify it was actually our baby. For a little background, I'm a scout. I've been a scout since I was 8 years old and last year I was leader of my team so I had to do all the paperwork and calls for finding places to camp. It was mid-November. I had to find a place to camp but since I was lazy I decided to wait a week before the actual weekend. I decided to call some owners so I could have places to sleep. As I called the numbers, all the owners were unavailable or simply not there. But then I see a number which I never called before, since it was at the end of the list. I call, and the old lady picks up the phone. I do the basic presentation and all. She agrees to let me and the team stay at hers, and we make arrangements. I go to her property to check out everything, such as portable water, the place to put our tent, and the campfire. The place was kind of dark, but it was nice. The week passes and Saturday arrives. Saturday is ending well and we did some great games and ate a lot and we had a good night show. As I go to sleep in the tent, I stay awake to finish paperwork for the next day. It is now midnight and I decide to sleep because we have to wake up early to go to church. As I switch off the flashlight, one of my newbie wants to go to the toilet aka the trees and asks me to come with her. I can understand because it's better to be accompanied at night, especially in the woods. She does her business and I suddenly hear some noises far away, but not too far. I tell myself it's nothing, it must be some animals trying to find food. We go back to the tent and that's when I hear footsteps approaching. As I hear those footsteps, I remain calm and tell myself maybe it's the old lady making sure we didn't put the fire too close to anything. But I still have an odd feeling because it's midnight and why would she do this at this hour? It goes silent and I don't hear any footsteps for about 10 minutes. Then I hear more coming to our tents. Thankful all of my girls were sleeping because they would have been scared. As I hear the footsteps which seem to come from one person, I hear others coming from back of the tent and I was like okay this is getting weird, I need to do something. I check the tent and thank god one of my newbies left some ambers from the fire so I could see everything between the fire and the tent. A minute passes by and a silhouette is just there between the fire and my tent. I stopped breathing, I literally froze. I started to move towards my phone when I saw the silhouette coming closer to the zipper of my tent. I sent a message to one of my bosses who always camps near the areas just in case something happens. But I knew she would take too long so I had to do something and think fast. That's when I had the idea. I put the alarm on my phone. The silhouette started to unzip the tent and I actually saw fingers from below. But as the silhouette heard the girls waking up, she or he sprinted back from where they came from. That's when I saw two other silhouettes sprinting back in the same direction. Everything ended well. 20 minutes later my boss came and stayed the night and we never had to deal with those silhouettes again, thankfully.
All right, so this happened to me last night. I want to share it with you because it's pretty creepy. For some context, I've been working at a bank for about seven years, and I've always enjoyed the steady income that it has given me. Two months ago, I was laid off from my job, and having no other form of income, I became to feel very stressed. One night later, as I put my kids to bed, my heart began to race uncontrollably. I thought I was having a heart attack, but as I began to calm down, I realized that I was just experiencing an anxiety attack. I never knew what an anxiety attack was before I experienced it, so it really scared the hell out of me. The next day I decided to go to the doctor to see what I could do to prevent it from happening again. He told me the best things to cope with my anxiety is to walk as often as I can. Walking releases endorphins, which results in happier moods. I took his advice and decided to walk every night at around 7 to 8. Walking was great. I enjoyed the peacefulness of it and began to meet new people in my neighborhood that I never knew existed. I observed the intricate details in all of the old, well-kept houses. Grand pillars that guided the stone walkways to the carved maple doors or different sized bricks that somehow fit together to create beautiful walls. The more I observed the houses, the more I wondered about one of the houses that stood out from the rest. It didn't look as well kept as the others. I wouldn't say it looked haunted, but it looked like it was vacant. I never saw a TV glow from a window or a light of any kind. There wasn't even a car in the driveway. It was just existing with other houses. I asked people who lived in the general area if they knew of anyone selling it or if it was being renovated and no one really had an answer. Last night, as I walked down a sidewalk, I came to the typical street corner that I pass every night when I walk. The corner has an old stone bench and it faces a vacant house. As I walked, I saw an older woman sitting down on the bench facing the house. When I walked closer to the woman, I noticed the strange attire she was wearing. It was like what you would wear to a funeral. She had on an all black dress with a black hat and a black veil covering her face. To make the situation less unnerving, I said hello to her and in the quietest, raspiest tone, she said, hello. It sounded like she smoked a lot. Now you're probably wondering why this bothered me so much. Although her demeanor was quite unsettling, the most unsettling thing about her was that after she said hello to me, she crossed the street and walked inside the house that I thought was vacant. It was like she was waiting for me on that night just to show me that the vacant house isn't vacant. Okay, so very weird experience my ex-girlfriend and I had back in 0405 in Royal, Louisiana. We were hanging out at her parents' house on a summer night watching movies, nothing out of the ordinary. We were around 16 or 17 at the time, so when 1 a.m. rolled around, it was time for me to head home. I didn't have a vehicle at this point, so she would usually drop me off. Keep this in mind, it's a rural area in Louisiana and we lived on the complete opposite sides of town. At this time of night, there were hardly any cars on the road, and it was rather spooky driving through the wooded areas to get to my place, which was secluded to say the least. We were about halfway to our destination, and in mid-conversation, when she stops talking and asks me if I noticed the headlights that had been behind us for quite some time, I replied no, that I hadn't noticed, but assured her that there was nothing to worry about. We continued our conversation, but now I was really paying attention to the headlights behind us and noticed that they were getting closer. To get to my house, there were a lot of turns down roads that weren't main roads, and these headlights were staying with us. At this point, panic starts to set in for both of us as we try to come up with a worst case scenario plan. I thought of just pulling up into the first driveway, but then thought, what if no one's home? And would they even help us at this time of night? Scratch that idea. 
I had one of those old flip phones at the time and decided the best course of action was to call my house phone and hope that my dad would answer. Between that point and us turning down my dead end road, I probably called 8 to 10 times with no answer, with the headlights still following us at every turn. I told my girlfriend to just pull into my driveway and lay on the horn. We pull in and do just that. The other vehicle pulls in right behind us. No one is coming out of the house, so she decides to cut across my front yard and try to get back on the road while I'm still calling. As we go to turn around, the other car cuts us off and that's when I look at this man, probably 50 to 60 years old, large rimmed glasses and smoking a cigarette. Our eyes met and he gave me the weirdest, creepiest grin and that's when I made up my mind that I was going to have to get out and confront this man. Right as I was building up the courage to do so, my dad ran out the front door and the man in the car sped away. Needless to say, we didn't get very much sleep that night. She stayed at my place and we reported the incident with the best description we could give, but to no avail. My mom left our family my freshman year of high school she moved a few hours away with her new boyfriend and we had no contact. Around my junior year, my mom reaches out. She tells my dad that I need to be inside at all times. She had recently left her meth head boyfriend who was about to go on trial for conspiracy to commit murder. I know, he was a real winner. She was going to testify against him, so he sent people to kill her, as homicidal dirtbags do. He sent people to her apartment complex because that's where she tended to go after they got into fights. Really abusive guy. So we get this call and I don't really take it seriously at the time because why would they ever come after us? I started seeing a lot of bikers and random cars doing laps around our complex slowing down right in front of our door. Until one day I pull up to my spot and there's a guy leaning on his car. He perks up when I get out. I turned around and we just stared at each other. He then climbs back into his car and drives away. I go inside, tell my dad. My dad goes nuts and I am standing there like an idiot, wondering what the heck was going on. He then proceeds to tell me that the reason she reached out to us wasn't because they were after us necessarily, but because she and I looked identical. So if I hadn't turned around to face the guy, who knows what would have happened. To my mom and her crazy, hopefully ex-boyfriend, let's not meet. When I was younger, I remember that I was home with my family. It was dark outside and there was a knock on the door and one of my parents answered the door. I was in a different room so I didn't hear or see what happened, but he was asking about his pink dog. I guess the guy left. I don't know what happened next, but my dad was rushing to the back of the house and went outside via the back door. I could sense the tension and it scared me. I asked my parents about it and they told me that they were worried that there was another person going around the back of the house. I didn't realize what they were so worried about, but it still made me terrified at the time. I now realize that it could have been a home invasion attempt. I think it's part of the reason why I'm so terrified and paranoid about a possible break-in or robbery. Every time I'm in the house on my own, I stay in my room and keep the dresser drawers open because I don't have a lock on my bedroom door and it would prevent anyone from entering. Another poster inspired me to tell the story of how I creeped out a creepy person. My dad used to have questionable habits. That's polite code for being an addict. Therefore, strange folks used to come to the house. When I was younger, we often had strangers come to the house while my siblings and I were alone. They'd knock on the door and try to get inside. And if they saw us, they tried to coax us into opening the door. Obviously, we never did. This particular situation occurred when my parents were actually home and my siblings already moved out. A car I didn't recognize started pulling into the driveway. 
Keep in mind, we lived in the mountains and the property was private, so absolutely nobody should be on our property. When the car parked, a familiar person got outside the vehicle. It was one of my dad's buddies. One that I was told was supposed to stay the hell away from us and was not a good person. He noticed me peeking through the curtains and tried to wave, but I shut them and called for my parents. My dad wouldn't leave his room, so my mother had to go inform him of the arrival of his friend. Our door had a glass oval design on it, and we had a clear screen door as well. So I'm staring at this guy through the oval glass door, and it's obviously making him uncomfortable. Ma goes outside and tells him that my dad would be out, but dude wanted to come inside himself rather than wait. From what I'm told, this man was potentially dangerous, so I had armed myself with the largest kitchen knife we had. My mom told me it was fine and he would be leaving soon, so I decided to put the knife away. But dude still walks through the door uninvited and makes eye contact with me, large knife in hand, halfway in the knife holder, with an angry look on my face and says, you know what, I think I'm gonna wait outside. Just tell him I'm here, thanks, and left abruptly. He never came back to the house after that day he actually ended up going missing for two days. His mom frantically spammed my parents. He eventually stumbled out of the woods and it turns out a deal gone bad ended with him getting beaten up and strung up in a tree by his ankles I think. So I moved into a duplex with my ex about three years ago in what we thought was a safer part of the city. One of our neighbors, Amber, works in the duplex rental office and her husband, Ed, was at the time fresh out of prison. Later we would see all of the swastika tattoos and had been and continues to do landscape work for the rentals like mow the lawns, cut down trees, etc. Other than that, he's at home mostly doing odds and end things like tinkering with his mower or truck or something. They're both super nice people, very kind and loving towards others. We have smoked weed together a few times. Ed smokes more than Amber and have talked about all kinds of things. So I thought I could trust them and felt very safe being their neighbor. I once mentioned how sometimes when I'm home alone, I hear steps in the attic over my room and what sounds like a chair being dragged how sometimes the noise follows me around the house and always freaks me out to the point of calling someone just to feel a little safer until the noises die down. Ed said, what, you think we're spying on you? In a laughing way, but it creeped me out a little. So then, I break up with my boyfriend and he moves out. This is recent, so a few months ago. Ed starts texting me and asks me if I want to smoke while Amber's still at work. I declined every time, finding different excuses because I still felt uncomfortable around him. Then he asked me if I wanted to have sex with him because he thinks Amber is cheating on him. I definitely shut that down and it was awkward as fuck. I didn't tell Amber because I didn't want to be kicked out or have some horrible awkward tension and I also hate confrontation so I kept quiet. That's when I start hearing things in the attic above my room more often. It freaked me out even more when I woke up to the loud bang outside my front door about 3 or 4 in the morning. When I went to examine it, there was a small lock pick outside the door on the ground, but no one was around. I kept the lock pick and the next day I texted a picture to Amber to let her know that I thought someone was creeping around and she said, oh that's Ed. That's his ice pick, not a lock pick, sweetie. No one can pick your deadbolt with that. But I know the difference in a 4 inch skinny ass lock pick and an ice pick. I was so scared to be alone here, especially at night. Our addicts connect and it's not outlandish to think that he could have been spying on me. I even found freshly drilled holes in the ceiling of my room. I just put wadded up pieces of paper in it. I try not to think of it. I honestly hope nothing comes of it and that I'm just being paranoid. Edit. For everyone that's saying I should call the police, I really have no evidence. I have the lockpick and still pictures of the door being messed with, 
But when I've gone into the attic, it's completely empty. I've never gone in it alone because its opening is in my garage and there's no ladder so it requires two people. But as of now, it's a gaping hole above my washer and dryer and it's very hard to get in without good upper body strength. I called my ex to come home when the dragging would start but by the time he got there, it would be cleared out. So I'm hesitant to report anything with no evidence. I'm staying with my boyfriend until I move out in a few weeks, despite my neighbors being upset that I'm leaving. To address another thing, I didn't see any of the swastika tattoos until months after I had been hanging out with them. He had his shirt off for the first time, and there were three on his body. Confused me because Amber and Ed were super wicked, so I believe that his tattoos were for protection in prison. Either way, after that, I stopped hanging out with him and would only speak to them if we were both outside at the same time. When I was in sixth grade, I was in band, clarinet. I wanted to play saxophone, but my grandpa had a clarinet, so that's what it ended up being. The band instructor was a middle-aged woman who I'm gonna refer to as Miss Fond, so as to protect our identity. Anyways, I didn't have a lot of friends, so I had a lot of extra lessons after school. After a while, she started offering me extra lessons at her house. Even then, that made me uncomfortable, and I refused. She was pretty persistent though, and would offer at least once a week. Eventually, I just stopped going back for extra lessons. One day, Miss Front announced that we had been invited to a Christmas parade downtown. Awesome, that's great. The school is literally a year old. It's great exposure, and best of all, fun for the kids. We were excited. We all had extra rehearsals, and the school made sure we had whatever we needed. Permission slips were signed. Everything went perfectly. The day of the parade, we all met at our designated areas. As we get dropped off, Miss Front tells me that parents were to pick us up at the end and her and some parade officials were the ones watching over us after they left. The parade starts. Everything goes smoothly, at least from my perspective. I was so nervous that there could have been a five float pile up and I probably wouldn't have noticed it. At the end, everyone gets picked up and I'm last. Left alone with Miss Frond, she immediately grabs my hand after the last kid's out of sight and tells me that I can call my mom from her house. She starts booking it with me in tow. I had very little experience of being on my own and didn't know how to act in this kind of situation. So despite the fact that I had recently been uncomfortable around her, I went along. Looking back, it probably didn't look that unusual to anyone because she wasn't tall and I really shot up in sixth grade. So it's not like I was being dragged. I kept up pretty well. I couldn't tell you in particular where she took me but it was definitely further out than where everyone else parked. Her car is the only one in sight and she starts beelining towards it. It was one of those dark blue green SUVs that pretty much everyone had in the late 90s. Suddenly, I hear my name being yelled from behind me. I turn to see my mom panting and sprinting towards us. Miss Franz's grip tightens and she starts speeding up. My mom yanks me from her grip and without a word takes me to her car and we went home where she proceeds to frown over me, which was confusing because I was pretty much ignored 99% of the time. I had no idea what just happened. I never saw Miss Frond again in school or heard anything about her ever again. I don't even know her first name to look her up and my family never spoke about it again. When I was in my early 20s and living in Chicago, I wasn't making much money. When I found this apartment, it was too good to be true. The top floor of the duplex with six rooms for $775 a month. The agent who showed me the apartment stressed to me that the landlords were very religious. I didn't have a problem with that, even if it did sound a little ominous. The landlords were an elderly couple that lived downstairs 
They seemed okay at first. When I saw them in the yard, they would smile at me. I took good care of the house. Then when they saw me having my boyfriend over, things started to get really weird. One day when I was in my office writing, I hear a knock at the door. I open it and this the old lady from downstairs. Before I could say hello, she says, have you ever gotten an abortion? I shut the door in her face. No thanks. This was a mistake. The house was laid out kind of weird. There was a door at the bottom of the flight of stairs that I thought led to a communal laundry room. But after accidentally opening it once, I discovered it led directly into my landlord's living room. I unfortunately learned this the hard way. I was in my kitchen cooking. My boyfriend was at work and I was by myself when I heard what sounded like a click of the door. Okay, I said out loud. What the fuck was that? I didn't really make the connection. It could have been the door that led into the living room. I walk into the hallway and look around. I don't see anyone at the end of the hallway. I poke my head into all the rooms. Nobody's there. Then I look down the staircase leading to their house and the neighbor lady is standing there staring down at me. I screamed. She flinched and stepped back into her apartment and swung the door shut. After that, every time I left my house, and I spent every possible moment out of the house after that, I would come back and something would be moved. A window would be shut. Once, the shower was dripping and my towel was damp. I couldn't lock the door because since it was technically a door to their house, they were the only ones that had the key. The knocking was so frequent, three or four times a day, that me and my boyfriend propped up an old mattress so we wouldn't have to hear it while we slept. The second to last straw was when I opened the door for work and the stairs were gone. I physically could not leave my house because there were no stairs. They had been dismantled and were sitting on their porch. I called them repeatedly, but they didn't answer. Finally, their son came out of the house and explained that they were remodeling their stairs. He told me that I had to cut through their apartment downstairs. I descended the stairs and opened the door and they were both sitting at their filthy table staring at me. The phone was in its cradle. They must have heard it ringing. They kept staring at me with this blank look on their faces. I crossed their kitchen and left out their back door. A few days later I came home from my job and noticed that the bathroom floor was almost completely flooded. It was like someone had left the faucet on or the shower on. The old woman, seeing that I had come home, came upstairs and knocked, screaming at me that I had flooded the bathroom and that her son had to come and fix it. I was so run down at this point that I just told her okay. Her son comes by a few hours later. He is shit-faced. I open the door and tell him that I need an hour or so before he comes in and he picks up something and swings it at me. It was a massive wrench. I somehow duck out of the way and he stumbles over. I book it down the newly repaired stairs and as quickly as possible call the police. They come down and take my complaint and claim since there is no physical contact, they can't really do anything. I learned later that this old couple has a daughter on the force. In the middle of the night, me, my boyfriend, and several of his friends pack all of our stuff into a Chevy Astro van. We lived in hotels and the van for a month until we found another house. They never attempted to contact us. Old landlords, let's not meet again. To set the scene, my friends, a married couple, had just bought a house in Central Oregon. The house was a little ways out of town, set back in the woods bordering a national forest. It sits on almost an acre of fairly wooded land and there's a small second dwelling in the back that is essentially a one bedroom house. They were letting me rent it from them. As we had all lived together for the last year in a rental house downtown. It's early in July and I had already moved in a few weeks ahead of them because the husband was finishing an accelerated summer class. I was working from home and was the only one there on the property. This was a bit before I adopted my dog, so I was really alone. 
All the neighbors are a ways away since all the plots were several acres minimum. So the little house was fairly isolated. It was about 9.30 a.m. and my work is in full swing. I would start early in the morning and the phones were generally extremely busy at the time. Suddenly I hear a knock on my door. This freaks me out because I was supposed to be alone on the property. But I quickly push my anxiety out of my mind and figure one of my friends probably came to work on the house and needed something from me. With the way the front door is positioned in relation to my windows, I have no way of seeing who's at the door without opening it. I open it to see a little old lady standing there. She introduces herself as the previous owner of the house and asks if I'm the new homeowner. I tell her no, that I'm renting the small unit from the homeowners but that they would be moving in in a few weeks from now. She then asked me if she could take some flowers from the garden, claiming that she planted them for her dead mother. I tell her to go for it because I don't really care and you need to get back to work. So I close the door and go back to work. Later that day when I clock out for lunch, I call my friends and tell them what happened. They seem oddly unsettled by the whole thing. They explain to me that the house had been owned by one couple since it was built and their daughter who was not the woman at my door as she was selling it because they had both passed away. This left me feeling a bit odd but I shrugged it off and tried not to overthink about it. About a week later my friends are doing work in the main house but I had parked in the garage so it didn't look like anyone was there. I was working again as usual. When I hear what sounded like someone walking through the brush outside. I texted my friend to ask what he was doing outside my house. But he said that he wasn't at my house and that they were both still in the main house. So I got up and looked through the blinds into the backyard. And there's the woman rummaging through the brush. I couldn't tell what she was doing exactly. As the brush was fairly high back there. But when I went out later it seemed like she had been digging. Of course, this freaked me out a bit. My car was the only one visible, so it would seem like I was alone. I immediately called my friend in the main house who came up with a dog to figure out what she was doing. The dog started barking as soon as they walked into the yard because it barks at everything. But he was still out in the front of the house. She was behind it. As soon as she heard the dog, I heard her start moving hurriedly away from the house. At this point, she moved to one of the blind spots on the side of the house by the garage so I could no longer watch her through my window. I heard my friend call after her, but she took off into the woods. There had been no other cars at the property, so she hadn't driven up. We never managed to catch her as she had a pretty good head start, so I don't know what she was doing around my house. I adopted the dog a few days later. I had been in the process since before the initial encounter. It's pretty frightened by anything unexpected, so she barks and growls any time a pine cone falls and hits the roof. Sometimes she will bark at what seems like nothing, especially in the beginning. I don't know if it was my friend or my dog who ultimately scared her off, but I haven't seen her since. To the flower lady, let's not meet again. This happened several years ago when I lived with my ex-boyfriend. We recently moved into a two bedroom house and set to work turning it into a home. We turned the back bedroom into an office as the house only had one bathroom and it could only be reached through that bedroom. We would have people crash on our sofa regularly and didn't fancy them having to trapeze through our bedroom to get to the loo in the middle of the night. So we had been living there roughly a month when this event occurred. My ex was out with his colleagues and I was home alone. I had spent the early evening watching TV and eating takeout. A couple times I heard some strange noises, but whenever I would try to zone in on it and figure out what the hell it was, it would stop. It had got later, so I decided to go upstairs and use the computer for a little bit before going to bed. At this point in time, we hadn't had our phone lines installed and I was still on a pay and go phone, which had run out of credit. I basically had no way to communicate with anyone while I was in the house that night. So I'm sitting in the back room with only a small table lamp that barely forms a glow, 
While I'm typing away on the laptop, I heard the noises again. It started as a light rattling noise, really faint, to the point where I had to strain to see if I was really hearing it or if I was imagining it. I shut the music off and tried to figure out what it was. I went into our bedroom and looked down to our front door. Nobody's there. I go back into the back bedroom but can't see much out that window. We had a small yard with a high brick wall and I saw a wooden gate with nothing to cast any light. From what little I could see, there was nothing in the back either. I sat back down and switched the music back on. Maybe 10 minutes later I hear an eerie screeching sound, like metal on metal. Again, very faint, as if whatever was making it was trying desperately to be quiet. I was getting more than a little freaked out at this point, so I went out of our bedroom to retrieve a heavy iron rod that we had found in the back of the built-in wardrobe. I didn't switch on any lights as I didn't know what was going on and I didn't want to alert any possible intruders of my location in the house. Remember, I had no way of calling anyone, and I was getting more than a little concerned that someone might actually be in my house. I made my way back into the office bedroom and closed the door as quietly as possible before bolting and lodging the chair under the handle. Nothing more happens for a good 20 minutes or so. I start feeling a little foolish for letting myself get worked up and put it down as being my first night alone in the house. But I don't switch the music back on this time, which was lucky because I started to hear sounds like two people whispering, both male voices. They didn't sound like they were coming from inside the house though. I had the office window open ever so slightly and the sound seemed to be floating in from there. I headed into the bathroom to see if I could get a better look into the alley that the house backs into. The office bedroom and the bathroom formed a L around a yard, with the bathroom extending further out. I climbed up on the ledge and inched the window open trying to see out into the alley. I couldn't see anything, but the whispering was louder and coming directly behind the gate. I couldn't hear the whole sentences, but I heard enough to summarize. Whoever these men were, they'd seen us move in and seen that we had quite a lot of valuable equipment. Guitars, computer, my DSLR. TV, gaming consoles, etc. I imagine they seen that I was home alone and had been waiting for me to go to sleep before trying to get into the house. I stayed perched there for what felt like an eternity until what seemed like the loudest thud in the world echoed up to me. They grown tired of trying to be stealthy and one or both of them were throwing themselves into the gate trying to break it down. I could see it shuddering under the blows and could only imagine how large these men must be. I'm a teeny girl, all about 5'3", and at that point weighed somewhere around 105 pounds. I was white with terror as I watched the gate groan under the stress. I sat clutching the iron rod, trying to think where I could hide from them. Suddenly, a glaring light behind me. At first I panicked and dropped out of sight, thinking they were shining a torch at the back of the house. But then I heard barking and shouting. I peeked again and saw that the house, which was across the alley from us, had a floodlight installed and it was illuminating both their own yard, mine, and the alley with light. I heard grumbling and cursing and two sets of footsteps hurrying down the alley. I stayed locked in the bathroom until my ex-boyfriend drunkly rolled in at 4am. I didn't sleep a wink that night and when I went out into the yard that morning, my gate was hanging on by one hinge, allowing easy access from the alley. When I looked at the back of it, the keyhole was covered in scratches as if someone tried to force open the lock. If they hadn't woken the house behind us, I dread to think what could have happened. I don't tell this story often because even in 2019 when it's less and less acceptable to victim blame, I still don't like having to answer the questions like, what time was it? And what were you wearing? I went to a college in a sleepy town near the US-Mexico border. With 100,000 people, it's small enough to know many, but big enough that new faces don't stand out. I frequented this walking trail that ran alongside the main road in town. The street was well driven and the path was used by runners, walkers, bikers, and people with strollers. Unless you were there near 11 p.m. at night, like I was the last time I ever walked it. I was a half mile from home. I had my headphones in and was walking to clear my head from some stubborn anxiety. 
Ironically, fear that something bad was going to happen. A car, I can't tell you what kind, slows as it sees me. At the time, I thought it was a black Mustang, specifically the one a friend of mine drove. I approached the car thinking it was my friend. Smallish towns, you know? As I get closer, I see it's not my friend. It's a man that I had never seen before. Shaved head, glasses, yellow graphic tee of sorts. I distinctly remember thinking that he looked like my Uncle Dan. I stopped where I was, even took a step back. His lips were moving, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. Being the painfully polite person I am, I take a step closer to hear him better. I make out the word campus. Was he asking for directions to the campus? He nodded. I replied to him, which campus? The community college or university? He stumbled, clearly not prepared enough to know that he would have to answer a question. He stammered out the name of the university in a way that it made my head scream. He's not from here. Nevertheless, I told him it wasn't far. He would just need to turn around and go about three or four miles. Another quiet utterance that I couldn't make out. One more cautious step forward. What? My heart is pounding. I know this guy is a creep, but I don't know what kind of creep he is. I've been staring at his face the whole time, but it wasn't until the last step forward that I noticed the way his hand was sitting and what he was holding. He flashed a handgun. As soon as he saw me see it, he said in a perfectly audible voice, Get in the car. I completely froze. I didn't run. I didn't scream. Most assuredly, I did not comply. I just stopped functioning for a few seconds. Again, get in the damn car. He was getting nervous. His hand was twisted on the gun. To this day, I can't explain why my brain chose to have me turn and walk away from the car. Walk. I heard the car start, and somehow I knew this was the end for me. He was turning around for me. I didn't want to watch. No one would even come for me if I screamed. I just walked, resigned in the moment. I had given up. I can't tell you why. Instead of turning around though, he slammed on the gas and fled, leaving me a shaking, profoundly vulnerable mess. Enough wit returned to me after a minute or so for me to call 911. A couple cop cars showed up shortly after and took my statement. I remember thinking that the cops didn't believe me. Once said I was pretty calm for someone that almost got abducted. I was even making jokes. For months after that, I scoured the internet looking for news stories about missing women or attempted abductions, hoping that I'd find a mugshot with his face on it. I never found one. As unbelievable as my story may sound, I promise I'm not trolling and every word I'm about to write is the honest truth. I can't specifically remember what grade I was in but I do remember I was in the middle school. I remember this detail because when this event took place, I was with someone that was only my friend during middle school years. After that, my friend moved away and we lost touch. This story takes place on the outskirts of St. Louis, Missouri during the 1980s. For reference, we will call the friend I was with, Amy. It had been a fun day with Amy my mom dropped us off at the mall where we had been wandering around window shopping and trying on clothes. This was a very teeny mall in a small town on the outskirts of St. Louis. Because this mall was so tiny, it didn't have a lot of restaurants or even a food court. However, there was a McDonald's across the way. To get there faster, you would cut through a field that was between the mall parking lot and a street. Once you cut through the field and crossed the road, the McDonald's was right there. So Amy and I went to McDonald's, ordered our food, and sat down. We were eating our ice cream and chatting away when a man walked in and sat down at the table in front of us. The way we were sitting put Amy's back to him and left me facing his direction. Almost immediately, I began to get an uneasy feeling because not only did this man not order anything to eat, he just sat there the entire time staring at me with the angriest look on his face. He wasn't even trying to hide the fact that he was staring. I also remember he had piercing eyes that were bright blue. Now keep this in mind, this was before cell phones were abundant, so calling my mom wasn't an option. Also, being as young as I was, 
It never occurred to me in my childlike mind that I should maybe get an attention of an adult working there and ask to use the phone. All I can remember thinking was, this scary man is making me feel very uncomfortable. So Amy and I finished our food and ice cream. I had to use her head to obstruct the man's view of my face and whisper to her what he had been doing. I told her if he followed us out, we needed to run. Sure enough, as soon as we got up to leave, so did he. We rushed out the door as fast as we could. Then we began to sprint. I looked behind me and he was getting into one of those boat sized cars that they made in the 70s and early 80s. Lucky for us, there wasn't much traffic, so we were able to cross the street before he had a chance to get us. When we got to the field, I turned around to look to see where he was again. Before I go further, let me note that next to the field was a street that ran horizontally, the one we just crossed, and then to the left of the field was another street that ran vertically. The street intersected the one we had just crossed, so the field was basically in the corner of these streets. The street to the left didn't run in a perfectly straight line though. It ran in a diagonal direction that would eventually take you to the mall parking lot. This was good because when I turned around again, I could see that he was watching us to see where we were going. Next, he turned onto the street to the left of us and was driving very fast. He was definitely coming for us. Like I said, the street that ran diagonally took him in the direction away from us but would eventually end up in the same parking lot. It was obvious that he was trying to get to the mall parking lot before we could get there because the road he was on went away from us and we were shortcutting it through the field plus running as fast as we could. We were able to get inside of the mall before he could catch us. We got very, very lucky. Once we got inside the mall, we frantically ran up to the security guard and told him what happened. Shockingly enough, he blew our story off as an exaggerated tale of two dramatic middle school children. Things were much different back then. Today if kids approached an adult with a story like that, the police would be called right away and a description of the man and vehicle would be taken. Even worse than that, when Amy and I told my mother the story, she blew it off as well. My mother was emotionally neglectful and was definitely not the best parent growing up. I had serious trust issues towards adults growing up because of many situations like this. I never felt protected by people that should have listened and kept me safe. I felt alone and unheard. This event being an important reason why I felt this way. But that's another story. So fast forward to a few days ago. My husband was watching a YouTube video about serial killers. I stopped dead in my tracks because as he was watching it, a familiar picture popped up on the video. One of the pictures of the men mentioned in the video was a man from McDonald's. I'm 95% certain it was him. His name was Tommy Lynn Sells. Let me add, I have an excellent memory and am definitely a visual learner. I suck at names but never forget faces. I can even remember a few people and events from when I was only 3 years old. This was such a scary event that I never forgot that man's face or the angry look that radiated off of him. It definitely stayed engraved in my young mind. No doubt that man was evil. My husband already knew my story. When I told him I thought that was the man who attempted to kidnap me, he was a bit skeptical. So together, we decided to do a little further research on the guy. What came up only solidified what I expected. Tommy Lee Sills was killing people, sometimes young girls my age, and he was indeed killing people in the St. Louis area during that time. He was also working carnivals and traveling, killing other people in other states. Unlike most serial killers, he didn't have a type. Anyone he could get his hands on was fair game. He just liked the rush of killing. What made this creeper was the mall that Amy and I were at had a carnival going on every summer in the parking lot on the other side of where we were. I can't remember what month it was when this happened, but I do remember the weather was hot. I'm relatively positive it was summertime. I wonder if he was working for that carnival. The picture of him on Wikipedia is exactly what the man in McDonald's looked like, even down to the same evil, angry look. 
I will never forget that expression. I've been mauling over and over this ever since. I don't know if I should contact the FBI with my story. Though he was executed in 2014, law enforcement knows of 22 murders he committed, but they suspect there are many, many more. The story might place him in the area someone disappeared from, but I don't know how helpful considering I can't remember the exact month or year. I don't even know if I would be believed. What would you readers do? I'm a 35 year old female and my story takes place when I was 15, but it feels like yesterday. It was a day that would change my innocent youth forever. I'm from a little village in Ireland with a population of a few hundred. The nearest town is about 10 miles away. Growing up in rural Ireland was very idealistic. Summers were spent playing football with neighbors or going to the lake swimming till the sun went down. I was lucky that even though the population was small and the houses are far apart, my best friend's house was only down the road. So during those summer months, Mary and I were inseparable. My friend and I grew up with lots of brothers and sisters in a safe village. We were given a lot of freedom and sometimes were gone all day, only to come back before dark. It was the mid 90s with no mobile phones, but our moms knew that we would be okay and look out for each other. One thing I liked during these summers, besides going to the lake and hanging out at each other's houses, was to go to town and look around the shops. The easiest way to get to town was to hitchhike, as there were no buses. Here in Ireland, we call it thumbing. Hardly anyone hitches now because most households have two cars and parents are a lot more protective. But back in the 80s and 90s, it was very common. Our parents were okay with it, but there were certain rules we had to follow. I'm not entirely sure who came up with these rules, but I assume our parents did. Rule number one, never hitch alone. You must thumb with at least one or two friends. Number two, never take a lift if there are two men in the car, but two or more women is fine. Number three, never take a lift from someone in a van. There could be more guys hiding in the back. Number four, this is the most important rule. When the car stops to pick you up, always ask the driver where they are going first. If you tell them where you're going first, they can pretend they're going the same place to lure you in. We were innocent, but had common sense, so we followed the rules down to a T, at least we tried to. My friend Mary and I used to hitch once a week during the summer. We would go to town with a population of a few thousand and look around the shops, eat ice cream and hang out. When we got a ride, we had to make small talk with the driver and as two shy 15 year olds, this bit sucked the most. To make it fair, we took turns sitting in the front and did most of the talking. One day, we spent a few hours in town. It was pretty uneventful, so we decided to thumb back. At around 3 p.m., we went to our usual spot to hitch from, just on the outskirts of town. We were only waiting for about five minutes when a car pulled up. Before we could ask where he was going, he asked us first, my friend told him, and he said he was passing through our village on the way to another one. Rule number four broken, but he seemed nice enough, and we just wanted to go home. It was my turn to sit in the front seat. The driver introduced himself as John, a farmer, and was super friendly. He was dressed in a worn tee with holes in it. He had tattered pants and smelled like cow shit. The car was full of bits of straw and was old and battered, like the driver. He was about 60, had no wedding ring on. Don't ask me why I noticed these things. About halfway between town and our village, he asked if we heard a noise. We replied no. There it is again. Sounds like a banging noise, he said. I didn't hear anything, so I just sat there quietly. I think it might be the exhaust pipe. I'll have to pull over to take a look. He pulled up on a busy road and went to go take a look. I didn't hear anything, said Mary. He seems like a weirdo, I said. Call it intuition, but even though he was super friendly and chatty, I got a bad feeling from him. 
Next thing, he comes back to the driver's side and tells us that the exhaust is hanging down and was hitting off the road. He tells us that he needs help to tie it up. It was then I noticed that he had a string holding up his pants instead of a belt. I thought this was odd. Anyway, he got some string from his boot, same color string as the belt, and we both got out of the car. Although I got a bad vibe from him, I didn't feel scared at this stage. We were on a really busy road and it was about 3.30 p.m. so we both got out of the car. He showed us the exhaust pipe hanging down and used a rag to hold it up since it was hot. My friend Mary took over holding it up while he secured it with a string. They were both kneeling while I stood back and watched. It was then I noticed his fly was open and I could see his private. He was clearly not wearing any underwear. He didn't have a belt on, so I guess I wasn't that surprised. In my head, I thought, Oh fuck, what is going on? Oh shit, oh shit. But I said nothing. I just stood there in shock. Mary hadn't noticed this at the stage, and continued to help with the pipe. When John was standing, he noticed his fly was open, and acted all shocked. Oh girls, I'm so sorry and embarrassed. I only have a safety pin holding the fly together and it must have come off. Please forgive me and get back in the car. Mary was stunned because she got a close up on his private, which left me to do the talking. I told him it was okay and that it was an accident. So we both got back in the car. He fastened the safety pin, even though I didn't see him look for it. At least all was hidden again. Back in the car, the atmosphere was very different. We both felt mortified and he kept apologizing over and over again. I looked at the passenger window and repeated, it's okay, it's okay. Then he said something that made my stomach turn. Well girls, you're taking it very well. If I didn't know better, I swear you liked it. Then he nudged me in my arm with his arm like you would do with a friend. I looked at him through the corner of my eye, my face still facing the window. When I noticed his fly was undone again, and he was exposed again. He must have noticed me looking because he said, Oh sorry, the safety pin keeps opening. Just don't look. Fine by me, I thought. But I said okay, and he continued to look out the window. He kept nudging me and saying, Don't be looking. Don't be looking. Giggling at the same time. He was doing it in a playful way. Like it was a joke. Mary started giggling too, because when she is nervous, she laughs. I know it wasn't her fault, but I was getting angry at this stage. He wouldn't stop telling me to stop looking. Then he said, Your friend is laughing. She must be enjoying the view. This made her laugh even louder. Now remember, we are both polite 15 year olds that always respect their elders and are a little shy and would never speak up to an adult. The nudging on my arm and my friend laughing was getting too much. He asked if this was the first Willie I've seen and told me once again to stop looking. I was turned facing the passenger window so much that I had my back to him. There was no way I could be looking. I lost my temper. I shouted out at the top of my voice. I'm not fucking looking. Mary, shut the fucking laughing up. Silence followed. He said he was sorry that he was only joking and I didn't need to be so serious. I said nothing and sat there, red with temper. I should have told him to let us out. I should have told him to cover himself up, the dirty old perv. But I was in shock too, and a part of me wanted to believe it was all an innocent mistake. We finally arrived in my teeny safe village. We got out and he said again that he was sorry about the whole thing. My friend got her voice back and assured him it was okay. I said it was all okay, not to worry about it, and said thanks for the lift. What he said back sickened me. He looked me up and down with a creepy smile and said, Girlies, thanks for everything, and drove off. We were left speechless. We sat down on a nearby bench to process all of this before going home. We made a deal we wouldn't tell our parents, or they'll never let us hitchhike again. My friend got her voice back and repeated, Pervert sicko, smelly bastard. He had this planned the whole time, over and over. About five minutes after sitting down on the bench, who drives by going in the direction we just came from? Only pervert farmer John, waving and smiling, 
while we both sat stunned. He had beeped to catch our attention, so much for just passing through our village. Went to the back of my mind, occasionally we would talk about Farmer John, but we made jokes about it and told some of our friends what happened. One day, I told a friend of mine named Brid, and a cousin of hers had told her a very similar story. The cousin lived in another village about 20 minutes in another direction from town. She was a few years older than us. While hitchhiking home one day, the same thing happened to her and her friend. The exhaust, the safety pin, and the undone fly. It was no accident and my worst fears were confirmed. Farmer John really was Pervert John. So to the man that smells like cow shit, has worn clothes, and uses a string to hold up his pants, and to the man who gets off exposing himself to young girls, let's not meet again. This creepy encounter happened to me almost 20 years ago, but it still gives me the creeps. It's a long one. I'd booked a taxi with a licensed taxi firm to take me from my friend's house to my home early in the evening. It was about dusk as the driver arrived. As I left the house to get into the car, he was coming to the house to get me and for some reason, as he turned to walk back to his car with me, he briefly touched me on my shoulder with his hand. It wasn't lingering, but it was deliberate, and I immediately thought, why is this guy touching my shoulder? My intuition said that it wasn't right, but I was in my 20s, and this guy must have been in his 50s, and I convinced myself that that was just something people from his generation did. I sat in the back. The journey should have been around 20 minutes, from north to south London, and in the first 5 minutes of the journey, there was some initial chat where he told me that this was his last job of the day and he had no plans afterwards. When he told me that, I felt a bit of fear, but I thought, this guy is from a licensed firm. He's been identity checked and approved to do this job. There's an ID card with his name and photo and registration number was clearly displayed on the dash. He was from a firm my friend used regularly and had an account with, although she never met this particular driver. My logical brain told me that he was clearly traceable to me if he decided to do anything, so he just wouldn't take that risk. Plus it was an early evening in a very busy area that made me feel safe. Regardless, by this time we were already on the road. I spent the next 15 minutes or so of the journey looking at my phone. I really don't know why, maybe I was deliberately trying to distract myself because I was nervous, but I felt my nerves were unreasonable. This was in the early 2000s, so the phone would have been basic compared to today's standards. But there must have been a game. I'm thinking snakes, or something on it to distract me, because I didn't look out the window for some time, until I noticed it was mostly dark. And when I did, I expected it to be very close to my home. To my horror, I saw that we were in some very deserted part of town I had never seen. This area was most certainly not on the way from my friend's house to mine. It should have been a straightforward drive through central London, and this was a very remote area with what looked like an abandoned housing estate and abandoned cars. I looked at the driver to ask where we were, but before I had a chance to say anything, I noticed that he was repeatedly looking left and right down the dark alleyways we were going to pass, and I noticed we were slowing down. I also noticed he was breathing weird, very audibly, like he was sort of pumped, wound up kind of way. That's when this overwhelming sense of knowing hit me. He was looking for a deserted place to stop. At that point, a very clear voice in my mind told me that he was going to rape and kill me, and I had to think fast. I blurted out, I don't know where I am. He didn't say anything. I then said words to the effect of, my friend asked me to call her when I was home safe and I should be home by now, so I need to call her and tell her I'm not home safe or she's going to call the firm and call the police because she's really over the top like that. This must have jolted him into thinking about the consequences of whatever he was planning to do. These really were the early days of mobile phones and not everyone had one then, especially the older generation. 
Perhaps it was a lifeline he hadn't considered I might try to use. With that, he turned out of the abandoned area and we came back to the main road. And after a while, I saw places I recognized and we were heading towards my home. He said, I'm sorry if I made you worry. But there was something weird about the way he said it. And that wasn't the end of it. When we got close to my home, I decided I did not want him dropping me off at home. I lived with my sister, but she was staying at her boyfriend's house that night, and we lived in a communal block. I was concerned he might come in the main front door and try to access my flat. So I said I realized I didn't have milk at home, and if he could drop me off at the store in the next street. He agreed to do this, obviously. I entered the store and hung around there for a bit. I remember being completely broke in those days. My friend even paid for my ride via her account. I did have milk at home and certainly wasn't going to buy some unnecessarily. So after a few minutes I left the store and walked a 3 to 4 minute way back to my flat. As I approached my flat, it was completely dark now and the area around my flat was poorly lit. As I approached my flat, I saw a car parked facing the main door of my flat and thought, oh my god it's him. And I knew he would clearly be able to see I had no milk as I didn't even have a bag on me and he would know that I was lying. As I passed the car, I couldn't bring myself to turn to look at him. So I got my keys out, quickened my pace and entered quickly. Once in my flat, I plucked up the courage to look out the window and sure enough it was that guy. He had driven from where he dropped me off to my flat and sat in his car staring at my flat. Just then, my friend called and I told her I had just got home. She couldn't believe how long it had taken, which was around an hour when it should have been 20 minutes. I explained the whole thing to her and as I was on the phone with her, I looked out the window again and he was finally gone. I didn't report any of this at the time. And from my safe vantage point of 20 years down the line, I regret it. At the time, I still doubted my gut instinct, even though I had a strong sense of knowing in the car. After I convinced myself it was fleeting hysteria, and my logical brain returned. My logical brain also told me that if I reported him, nothing would be done because he hadn't actually done anything that I could prove. And if he admitted the detour, he could just say he took a wrong turn and could have denied returning to my flat. This was about 8 years ago. When I was waiting for my parents to pick me up, a man approached me. He asked for directions for a specific supermarket, which was strange because everyone knew where the supermarket was located, but it was nowhere near our location, so I was really weirded out that he was asking me to give him directions for some place that wasn't even close by. I was always really awkward at making conversation, so I shrugged and said something like, just turn right and then go left, so that he would leave me alone. I started to walk away from him, but as I took another step forward, he asked me the same question again and took a step closer towards me. I think at that point I might have sensed something was wrong and that this guy might harm me if I didn't think fast. Thankfully enough, I saw my mom's car approaching me just after he asked that and I was relieved to safely sit inside as quickly as I could. I didn't think much of it until recently when I came across a post about a very similar thing happening to another woman. She suspected that the man might have abducted or assaulted her if she hadn't threatened him with a call to 911. I was instantly reminded of my own incident and I don't know what to think. Would I be safe today if my mom didn't come by on time? I'll just get right into it. I moved to a large American city back in February and this happened one of my first weeks living here. I got onto a pretty crowded subway on my way home from work. A lady got on and sat down next to me. She looked in her mid-thirties and was pretty and put together. Two girls got on right behind her and I immediately noticed her watching them. Pretty much straight away she started talking to them saying, Oh, don't touch the subway pole. That's gross. Pretty normal so far. And considering how forward she was being, I figured they knew each other. 
but she kept going. No, seriously, don't touch it. What's your names? Where are you from? Still not too weird, yet I started feeling nauseous. It seemed off. She was too persistent. They answered all her questions at first, but when it got into more personal, How old are you? 14 and 15? Are you sisters? Where are your parents? Where are you staying? Times Square. She tried to figure out exactly which hotel they were staying at. They would dodge the questions or answer vaguely. They were visibly uncomfortable. When she asked them for their room number, they turned their backs to her. Meanwhile, I wanted to say something, but I'm new here and I'm freaking out. I would have just brushed it off as some weird lady being too friendly, but the alarm bells were going off and everything felt wrong. I felt like if I stepped in, maybe she would turn her sights on me. I'm also a younger looking girl. In retrospect, of course, I wish I'd stepped in the moment I was frozen and trying to downplay the whole thing in my mind. It's that feeling of panic when you're not sure if the panic is justified. Also, she would mumble something under her breath every so often, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. I didn't see a phone, but there may have been headphones under her hat and scarf that I wasn't aware of. Also, I should note that the subway was packed at this point so it would be very difficult for the girls to move away from her. I'm assuming that the girls got the attention of the lady in front of them sitting across from me and signaled for help because she started pretending to be their mom, answering questions for them, though the creepy lady was still directing her questions to the girls' backs. I don't think she had been paying attention the whole time because she seemed to be more confused than alarmed or concerned. The fake mom's answers were contradicting the girl's answers from before, and the lady didn't like that. She started grilling fake mom, saying, I thought you were from Florida. The girl said that their parents are back at the hotel. Among other things, to show that she knew this wasn't really their mom. So the Times Square stop rolls around, and lady's like, Girls, this is your stop. If this is really where your hotel is, get off now. And she started to stand as they get off as well. They're completely ignoring her now with their backs turned. At the next stop, they hurry off with the mom lady, almost running. And of course, to my horror, creepy lady jumps up to follow them out. That's everything I can recall. Once I had a few minutes to process everything, I had a panic attack. I got back to my apartment and cried. Like the title says, it still messes with me months later. I have some general anxiety, but I don't usually fixate on things like this. I think what gets to me is my instincts were telling me that this wasn't your average subway weirdo. This seemed bad, like possibly sex trafficking or something. The way she was so persistent, even though there are witnesses, even though this mom figure stepped in to help. Who was she talking to so quietly? What do you guys think? Weird lady, motel scout, or something worse? Thanks for listening. I feel a bit relieved to get this off my chest. For a bit of context, I am 13 and have a younger brother who was 9 at the time and my mom and dad were living in our house together. Every now and then my brother will ask me to lay in his room with him. It usually happens if he can't sleep, is scared of something, or just wants me to lay with him and watch a movie sometimes. So this story happened on some day around June or July. It was late and I couldn't sleep. I was so tired but for some reason I couldn't bring myself to fall asleep. It was like something wanted me to stay up. I was squirming around, trying to get comfy, but it wasn't helping much. Our upstairs is arranged like this. When you walk up the steps, there's a hall. The first door on the left is my room. First on the right is a storage room. The second on the left is Dennis's room. The second on the right is my parents' room. Finally, the door at the end of the hall is the bathroom. So I was laying there trying to sleep when I heard a door creak open and then shut from downstairs. I thought it was really weird but figured it was just my mom. 
who usually stays up late. I was paranoid and tired, so I texted her just in case. What she replied with really freaked me out. It was something along the lines of, No, I'm in bed. So is your dad. Why? My eyes widened, and obviously, I was pretty freaked out, as I was hearing footsteps by now. I told her what happened, and she told me it was just my imagination, and to just go to sleep. I was skeptical, but I listened, and tried to sleep. Then I heard more footsteps, and other noises, so I texted my mom again. She said she heard it too now. I wasn't crazy, which calmed me. Then again, that meant someone was downstairs. I text her, getting panicked. She walked into my room, and she was pretty panicked too. We stood there until we heard a crash. But that's when we both absolutely freaked out. I started pulling my hair, trying to think of what to do, as she ran to my dad and started shaking him awake, saying, Get up! Wake up! Someone's in the house! He got up quickly, grabbing his BB gun. We didn't have a real gun, but it looked exactly like a pistol. He carefully walked downstairs, and I heard running as he left our vision. I got my phone ready to call 911. But then, my dad yelled up, Nobody's here. The cat's laying in the dining room. I was very confused. My mom chuckled. It was just the cat. I didn't believe that at all. I shook my head, explaining that the cat wasn't big enough to make all that noise, let alone open and close the front door. My dad came back upstairs and said he checked the entire first floor. I asked if he checked the basement. He said no. Wow. I bet they ran into the basement and hid when they heard you, I said, worried. My mom insisted no one had been in the house. I sighed, but grabbed a pipe. I don't know where it came from, but I still have it and use it for cosplay sometime. And I laid down. I fell asleep that night, but could have sworn that I heard the door close once more. That night still gives me the creeps. I was sleeping over at a friend's house with a bunch of my friends. And the house that we were at was pretty old. But we live in a fairly big and crowded town. There are apartment buildings outside this kid's house and the middle school and high school right down the street. He had this one room on the side of the house that was the playroom. It's basically where we would all hang out and where we would sleep during sleepovers. It was spacious and the thing about this room is it had a huge window on the side and I mean the entire wall was a window. And this so happened to look out on a busy street and sidewalk and you could see the apartment complex from the window. So one night we were sitting on the couch that was right next to the big window and it was late and the darkest it gets there. We were all in blankets around the room watching YouTube and it was about time for everyone to settle down. When I saw this person, he was standing about two feet away looking in the huge window. My friend saw him first and yelled for us to look and we saw him just standing there watching us. We all ran to the kitchen and hid behind the counter and sat there for like 35 minutes. When we decided to go back into the room, the guy was gone and we never saw him again. We saw all kinds of people walk by and look into the window, but something about this guy was weird. Whenever we sleep there again, we always talk about that night, and every time, it gives me chills. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place, but I've held on to this story for about six years because it sounds crazy, and I got told not to talk about it. I went camping six years ago with my now ex-boyfriend. The campsite we picked was beautiful. We were able to drive in through some rough trails. The spot we picked was right next to some hiking trails that weren't very far from some natural hot springs and a huge waterfall. We were in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely no one was around. We set up camp next to the car, went hiking, soaked in the hot spring, and then came back and had dinner. It was all very normal until we woke up the next day. I need to give some context as how we slept that night so that you understand my confusion. Before we went to sleep, I put our food in the cooler and the stereo we brought in the car and locked it. 
I put the keys in the front pocket of her backpack and put the backpack next to my sleeping bag on the far side of the tent away from the door. My boyfriend at the time slept nearest to the door of the tent with the gun next to him. We woke up in the morning and I felt fine. I had slept hard and from the inside of the tent everything seemed normal. When we got out, our campsite was absolute chaos. The fire pit we made was ruined. The cooler had been thrown and food scattered all over. The stereo was smashed into pieces and lay next to a tree. All the car doors were open, including the trunk. We stood there for a minute in silence, just taking everything in. The woods felt off now. It was quiet and not the beautiful campsite that I saw yesterday. Everything about those woods felt wrong. My ex accused me of not locking the car the night before and that some animal got into our stuff. I promised him that I locked the door and went into the tent to grab the keys from my backpack, but they weren't there. I later found them on the ground right next to the car. We quickly threw everything in the trunk and left. My boyfriend was quiet and wouldn't talk to me about what just happened. He finally spoke up when we were almost home and told me that he had a dream the night before that someone was kneeling over him in the tent, holding his gun and just staring at him. When I tried to ask him more questions, he got quiet again and said that he didn't want to talk about it and that I shouldn't talk about it anymore either. I've tried to forget about it, but I just can't. Something really wrong happened to us in the woods that night. When I was 16, about seven years ago now, I was at home alone often for as much as a week at a time due to my dad traveling a lot for work. I didn't scare easily, so this didn't bother me too much until one night when I had quite the interesting late night encounter. It was a Friday night and I ordered pizza, planning to devour the whole thing and play some Halo all night. It was a rainy night and heavy winds and I was sort of worried that the power was going to shut off and ruin the rest of my night. Luckily, the storm calmed down and it got very quiet and calm later that night. It was about midnight or so and I was hopping out of the shower ready to keep playing some video games when I thought I heard a faint knock on the door. I figured it was some thunder in the distance and continued to go about my business until I heard the doorbell ring. Of course, my first thought was who the hell is ringing my doorbell past midnight? So I slowly crept through the hallway and cut through into my dad's office, which is right next to the front door. I crouched next to the window and peeked through the blinds. Standing there was a girl no older than 13, very pale, dark hair in a ponytail, wearing what looks like to be a Catholic school uniform or some sort of private school. I wasn't too bright back then and didn't think to myself that this could be some sort of trap. So I cracked open the door, thinking maybe she got the wrong house since it was Friday night. How can I help you? I asked her. She said that she was looking for Kaylee. I told her maybe she got the wrong house and that there's no Kaylee here. She said, maybe, thank you, and gave me the creepiest smile and even weirder, didn't move away from the doorstep. I told her goodnight and closed the door. I quickly went back into my dad's office to peer out the window and there she was, still standing at my doorstep and smiling, staring directly at the door. At that point, I was freaked out and wondering how I ended up in this weird horror movie type of situation in a matter of five minutes. I considered grabbing the gun we had for self-defense when I started coming to the realization that this could be a scout or a setup for a robbery. After a few minutes, she slowly starts to walk away and goes down the street out of sight. About 10 minutes goes by and after texting a few of my friends explaining what I just experienced, I go to the kitchen to get a drink. Suddenly, our motion sensor lights go off in the backyard. This happens a lot when animals run through the yard, so I took a quick peek out the back window to check it out and there the girl is again, back facing the house in the middle of our fucking backyard, lit up by these extremely bright lights. I crouched down and strained to listen because I thought I heard her speaking as well. After hearing some muffled words, she screams, Not right now! So loud that she woke up the neighbors. She turned around towards the house 
took one step like she was going to the back door, but turned around again. She calmly walked to the door in the fence, opened it, and walked into the street behind the house, cutting through my neighbor's yard behind me. I watched her for as long as I could on the street until she disappeared from sight. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. I thought maybe some kids were just playing a prank, but it troubled me for a while because something felt very sinister about the girl. This happened recently, and I don't know what to make of this. So I'm a 21 year old female, not really an artsy person, but I do appreciate, like many, the beauty of nature and try my best to capture it from behind the lens. I grew up in a major city and the night sky hasn't always been visible, so moving to a smaller city for school has had its perks. Less population, more wildlife, and I could see the stars. My sister, which was 19, let's call her Ella, also came to my school and we were very close. So we would do a lot of things together, including living together. This is sort of important for the backstory. I had a small get together to attend to celebrate my friend's birthday and drove home pretty late, maybe 2.30 in the morning or so. On my way home, the road is empty and scarcely lit, but the moon was a beautiful crescent and I was really admiring my view. As I'm pulling into the parking lot of my home, I called Ella. Both of us normally stay up pretty late because of lots of schoolwork. I asked her if she wanted to come down and go look at the night sky and maybe do some night photography. She said yes. She got in the car and we started driving. We live in a suburban area surrounded by a lot of woods and I turned into a back road instead of the main one. I asked Ella if she wanted to stop and take the photos and she said yes. There was a large parking lot that we spotted as we drove by a bunch of department stores. And of course, since the department stores weren't open at night, it was empty. I knew that it was sketchy at night, but at Ella's assistance and seeing the sign that said no deliveries between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m., kind of important, I turned in. I park and she starts taking some photos for her social media, trying to take pictures through the windshield, but it was dirty, so she gets out. I'm in the car, engine running, all doors locked except for hers. She knows not to stray too far away from the car because it's night. But then she comes up to my window and told me to come out and take pictures because there was literally no one there. I was a little reluctant because what if something happened and we needed to leave right away? So I said no initially, but she insisted. Five minutes of her trying to convince me to come out. I eventually got out of the car and locked it. She turned her camera towards me, so I walked maybe 15 to 20 feet away from the car facing the road we drove in from. I was posing for her and she was taking a 360 degree video. We may have been just doing this for maybe a minute and I was on high alert watching the road and watching my surroundings. I see a white van with tinted windows drive onto the same road we drove in from and I was praying that it won't turn in but it's slowing. Knowing that there was not supposed to be any deliveries at this time of night I didn't have a good feeling. Being on high alert, I booked it towards my car. As I passed my sister on the way to the car, I said, Ella, get in the car. She was also watching the road and hearing the urgency in my voice. She ran to the other side and got in and then pulling onto my seatbelt and locking the doors. Ella tells me to hurry up. I'm watching as a van is in the lot now, stopped where we were literally less than a minute before. The entire van is tinted, so I can't see in, even with my high beam lights on. I can't see who's driving, and I can't see who else is in there. I didn't even think to look at the license plate, I just turned and booked it. Instead of going out the way we came in before, I drove past the entirety of all the department stores as close as I could get because of the cameras. If anything happened, at least there would be a record of us being there. Here's the low key terrifying part. I drove out the main exit and the entire time I'm driving, I'm watching out of my rear and side mirrors. Whoever was in the van didn't do anything else. They just turned their vehicle back around onto the main road that they had pulled in from, turning the way they just came from. I didn't go home right away, 
Although my apartment was less than five minutes away, I went and drove around for almost an hour around the whole college town and around the city. I took so many different routes. Pays off for being in the area for four years. I think I lost the van about a half hour later, but just to be safe, I drove around a little longer, taking a different route home, getting there around 4 a.m. Nothing ended up happening to me, but be careful out there. It felt so surreal, like a horror movie. Ella and I avoided potentially getting into a horrible situation, possibly life-threatening, mostly by getting lucky. When I got home, I couldn't sleep. The adrenaline, plus knowing that we avoided a situation in which we could have been hurt, really plagued me. I was terrified, but I think I handled it pretty well. Had my car stalled or something, I'm not sure what would have happened. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. If you're a woman, please, please be careful out there. I wish the world was kinder to us than it is. Shortly after my son was born, I moved into a new house with my girlfriend. I felt really lucky as we found an actual house for rent that was cheaper than any apartment we came across and it was in the school district that we wanted. The house was quite isolated from neighbors and the front of the house was abnormally far from the street and the backyard was surrounded by a dense tree line. At nighttime, it looked as if we were surrounded by nothing but darkness. It wasn't long when I started to feel unnerved, like someone was watching me. This feeling almost always came from one window in particular, the window above the sink where we also had an air conditioning unit. It was the only window in the house where I could fit and reach the outlet. I brushed it off and did my best to ignore these feelings because I didn't want to freak out my girlfriend. I knew if I put the idea in her head that she would never stop stressing about it as she was diagnosed with anxiety. One night, I was on the couch with my girlfriend and talking when I got that feeling again. I noticed my girlfriend got silent and suddenly was staring at that very same window that made me uneasy. So I asked her if something felt strange. She tells me that sometimes she feels like someone's watching her from that window, but didn't want to mention it to me because she was afraid that I would think that she was crazy. Things got a lot worse from there. I started hearing the dividers of the AC unit open when we were in bed at night. We would hear pebbles and coins being thrown in our kitchen. I would hear twigs snap outside at night and I would hurry to grab a flashlight and shine it outside the window. I was actually hoping to see someone at that point because the unknown element was driving me crazy. Every night I was terrified that I would come home from work and my family would be murdered. I was still hanging on to the idea that I was just imagining this stuff, but it was all confirmed one morning. I went out back to smoke a cigarette when all of a sudden I catch something out of the corner of my eye and all the hairs on my back stand up. Goosebumps covered my body before I even realized what I was looking at. On the screen to my bedroom window, someone wrote, coming, but backwards as if they wanted me to read it from the inside. What made this even scarier was that window was open and I slept right next to it. Basically you could reach and stab me in the back without even having to stand on anything. I started to keep that window shut and locked. I stacked empty soda cans in front of them so if someone did manage to open the window, they'd make tons of noise coming in. One night, I got home from work at my usual time, about 1 a.m. We were going out of state for a couple of weeks the next morning, so I really wanted to just get home and sleep. I shower, we get all the lights off, and make our way into bed. Almost immediately, we hear the divider of the AC unit open up and pebbles coming and bouncing through our kitchen. I snapped. I got up and screamed. I'm sick of this shit. I'm gonna fucking kill you. I got dressed, hand my cell phone to my girlfriend, and told her to lock the door behind me tell her to call 911 and not open the door unless she's certain it's me. I get outside and I'm just listening for movement. It probably took me a few minutes to get dressed and go outside. Finally, about 20 seconds later, I hear a car door slam on the street directly behind us through the tree line. I hear tires squeal and peel out and I can hear driving fast through our neighborhood. I'm hyper aware at this point 
and I could tell the streets it's taking as I've been in this neighborhood my whole life. I hear it turn onto the main street and realize that it's gotta pass my street next, but it doesn't pass my street, it turns down it. It drives really fast past my house. All I could think to do was to point at it, looking as aggressive as I could. I went to sleep. We went on vacation for a couple weeks and none of us got that feeling ever again. We never even heard a single noise out of the ordinary again. But the next time I moved, I made sure to buy a house with the windows high off the ground. When I was 15 years old, my family moved to a new state and into a new house. I ended up with the largest of the three upstairs bedrooms, one that had a bathroom attached and interesting enough, a door in the closet. Inside of the normal closet was a door, maybe two feet by three feet in size. I've always loved the paranormal and this door instantly reminded me of the one in the movie Coraline. So I was very interested. When opened, you could tell that there was insulation blocking the door, but it had either been pushed out of the way or pulled. The door led to a small attic like room. It was unfinished, bare wood, and was warmer than the rest of the house. I shut the door after not finding anything interesting and didn't give it another thought for the next few weeks. This was until one day I woke up and the small door was open. My initial thought was maybe I opened it and had forgotten. I walked over, shut it, and went on with my day. The next morning I woke to find the door open once again. Now this time, I knew for a fact it had been shut when I fell asleep. Try not to read too much into it. I thought maybe it was one of my two siblings trying to mess with me, but that wasn't really like them to wake up in the middle of the night to try to prank me, but I couldn't think of any other logical answer. I asked them both numerous times and they were so uninterested that they simply said they had no idea what I was talking about. I even ended up scaring my little sister just from talking about it. The next night I decided to lock the door instead of just shutting it. When I went to do just that, I saw the side of the knob that locks was not on my side of the closet, but inside the attic room. I found this very strange, as this room couldn't really be used for anything besides storage, and if that's the case, it would make no sense to have a lock on the inside. It would make a lot more sense to have a lock on the outside, where it would be easily reached. Nevertheless, I locked the inside of the door and shut it. I gave it a hearty pull and wiggle to make sure it was actually locked, and it stayed put. Confident that it was truly shut this time, I went to bed. In the morning, the door was open. Seeing that small door in my closet wide open after locking it myself the night before was absolutely terrifying. It was at this point that I decided to tell my parents what had happened. Both of them laughed, joking that I had a ghost and didn't believe a word I said. I was on my own. What happened next is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. I'll preface it by saying I've never had sleep paralysis and have never had it since the story took place. I went to my bedroom to take a nap. It was mid-afternoon, so the sun was still out, coming through the blinds. I don't remember falling asleep, but I do remember opening my eyes and the room being considerably darker. I remember laying there on my side, face to face with this dark humanoid figure sitting next to the head of my bed. It was just black, like a 3D silhouette. It was sitting cross-legged, mere inches from my face, and I couldn't even scream. I was frozen. It felt like it was hours, but probably only a few seconds, before the room was lit with the warm afternoon sun, and the figure was gone. I was still laying in the same exact position, and the door was open. This was the last straw for me. I was completely terrified of that door, and whatever came with it, I grabbed one of my scarves and tied the doorknob to the shelf of my closet so that it couldn't be opened. Thankfully, that worked. I moved out of that house three years later, but my little sister moved into my room after I moved out. My parents and sisters moved out of that house a month ago, and up until the day they left, that scarf never left the door. I've never had sleep paralysis before, and I don't know if that's what I experienced. 
but it never happened when the door was shut. I can't sleep, so I thought I'd write out this experience I had a while back. Someone I loved very much passed away four years ago, and I was devastated over their death. The graveyard he's in is beautiful, and it became my spot. Before he died, we actually used to walk his dog there together. I would visit his grave for hours sometimes and read, listen to music, walk around. I would go at night, often after I got off my second shift, around midnight. One night, I was really upset about something and wanted to visit him. I pulled in and drove over to his site, but something fell off. I got out of the car and immediately wanted to get back in. I have really good intuition and tend to always listen to my gut, which has never lied to me. I drove back. But you have to go all the way around the cemetery to get back to the entrance. As I got to the top of the hill before the gate, which is pretty far in, I see a person walking super fast, like almost speed walking towards my car. I jump a mile. I look closer and an old woman was walking directly towards my car with that gigantic smile on her face. After seeing the creepypasta, the smiling man, it became one of my irrational fears. It was pretty chilly that night and she looked like she was only wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants, no parka or anything. The woman walked almost into my car then turned and walked off towards the woods on my right side. I drove farther towards the gate and looked back and she was literally walking straight into the woods. Now at this point it was like 1am and the cemetery isn't in a good neighborhood. It was bizarre. I drove out of there as fast as I could. When I was 11, my dad was letting a friend stay in the trailer that he bought for road trips. We also had a dog. So one night, around midnight, a man opens the gate to our house and just strolls in. He manages to befriend my dog and then he just goes to the back of my house. My room was in the area where people do laundry and you were able to access it from outside of the house. So this man comes in through the back and just stares at me while I sleep. My dog is right next to him, not doing anything. My sister eventually comes in for some reason. She calls my cousin's name thinking it might be him checking up on me. After a while the man just looked at my sister and walks back out of the house. My sister wakes me up slightly scared. It seems like she was trying not to freak me out and she follows the man. She sees him walking out through the driveway. After he opens the gate, he just collapses on the ground. The police eventually came and we saw that he was just a drunk. I didn't feel like I was endangered, but after that, I definitely locked my door since I didn't feel safe with just my dog. This happened years ago. I was using a Motorola flip phone so that I might help date it for you. I was on the last train home from a night out in Manchester. The train got in around 11.40 p.m. and I had about a mile walk to get home. This is a very familiar route along the main road, but I lived in a pretty small suburban town so by that time the roads were dead. The only other passengers quickly dispersed and I found myself walking home alone. I hadn't really noticed how quiet it was as I was using my phone to talk with a friend. I became aware of a beat up old car creeping alongside me at my walking pace and a guy with a gut looking at me from the driver's seat. I couldn't make out any facial features in the dark and he was alone in the car. I remember the car was a mess, rubbish on the dash, just really messy. I was suddenly on high alert. This wasn't normal. For some reason, I ended the conversation as I wanted to keep my wits about me. But in hindsight, I probably should have stayed on the phone. I looked at the guy and shrugged and made signs for him to drive on and leave me alone. He just kept driving at my pace. 
His face, now lit up by the street lights, was expressionless. This went on for a few excruciating minutes, and then all of a sudden he sped off. I relaxed, thinking that he was just messing with me, and he had his fun, and is now driving off. I then saw him turn into a petrol station up ahead. The petrol station was closed, all lights off and there would be no reason for him to pull in there. It was also right on my route home. I would have to pass it. Everything was telling me not to walk past and that he was waiting for me. I then held back and decided to call my friend who lived nearby and he said that he would be right out to meet me so I needed to give him a couple minutes to get dressed and get out to me. I waited by a bank and obviously didn't walk past the petrol station. He hadn't came out in this time. He was still there. When an amount of time had passed and I hadn't walked by, the car pulled out and headed towards me again. I was freaking out now. This guy then just parked right next to me where I stood, just staring at me. He didn't make any moves to get out of the car. I then start to run to the direction my friend would be coming from and he starts following me again and again at my pace. Luckily, I see my friend running towards me and I guess the driver saw him too as he then speeds up and drives away. I think he was just trying to fuck with me, but it does creep me out wondering what would have happened if I had walked past the petrol station that night. It was a summer right after I graduated high school. A good friend and I decided to try our hand at camping we grew up in the greater Los Angeles area, so our knowledge of the great outdoors was nothing beyond a couple years of Cub Scouts when we were in elementary school. In other words, we had almost no idea what we were doing. We packed a tent, a couple sleeping bags, supplies, etc., and headed off in his car. Note, I grew up in the 80s. We drove north of the 395 for about six hours and then headed westward into a mountains in the area of the Inyo Canyon. First mistake, we didn't plan on which place to camp. We played it by ear, i.e. like fools. Second mistake, we left in the mid-afternoon. It was pitch black darkness when we arrived in the general area. We had driven off the main road onto a dirt road in order to find a spot to camp. The dust from driving on a dirt road overwhelmed the headlight high beams when we finally decided to pull over and set up camp. It was around 11.30 at that time and we were exhausted and famished. Any place was a good spot to camp for us given our only reason to do so at that point was our hunger and exhaustion. Third mistake, we didn't bring flashlights. We only had Bic lighters for our cigarettes. We tried to set up our tent using the lighters and the headlights from the car, which was parked about 10 to 15 feet away. The wind was blowing, so the lighter constantly went off after a few seconds, either directly because of the wind or indirectly because the wind would push the flame to our thumb. Clearly, we were being complete idiots. We finished setting up the tent, but at that point, I was too tired to eat. My friend managed to make some instant ramen, we smoked a cigarette in the car and then crashed out in the tent. We awoke to a very cold morning. It must have been around 5.30. Immediately upon exiting the tent, we realized that we were camped at the entrance of a hiking trail. There were at least two no camping signs in visible distance from us. We dismantled the tent, cleaned up, and cleared out. That morning we ended up buying some cheap flashlights and a nice hot meal in a very small town. It wasn't really a town, more like a few storefronts and shops on a main road, about the length of an average city block. We went into some office, though I don't recall exactly what it was. It might have been a park ranger station, or the office headquarters for a campground. In any case, we found and reserved a site for the night. The campground was basically a large circle, with campsites along the circumference, with each campsite being around 50 yards from its neighbors, in the middle of the circle was a common area for bathrooms and showers. We circled it once, and I think that we saw that one family was all set up with their tent and camper. We found our spot and set up our camp. 
which was quite far from them. That night was when we had our creepy encounter. My friend and I were laying in the tent, shining our flashlights upwards and chatting. Our new flashlights would eventually give out, yes, broken. Our fire pit was about six feet from the opening of our tent, and it was just glowing ambers at that point. We probably should have completely put it out, and we probably shouldn't have had our tent so close. In any case, there we were, chatting away and having a good time. My friend began to be distracted with his foot. After the third or fourth time, he got up to check his foot. I asked him what was wrong. He told me that something was tapping his foot from the outside of the tent. His foot was against the side of the tent wall, so from the outside you'd be able to see the bulge from the tent side where his foot was. It was as if pebbles were being thrown at his foot through the tent. There it was again. What the hell? Each time it happened, there was a sound like pebbles or a light tap. We sort of laughed it off, assuming it was a twig or grass moving in the wind, or perhaps a loose strap on the outside of the tent. I don't recall exactly how it happened at first, but I do remember we suddenly became silent at the same time. A sound came to be audible for both of us, footsteps slowly moving towards our tent. We wondered if it was a bear or other non-human animal, but it seemed distinctly bipedal. They were very slowly and measured, like a step every two seconds. I finally said in a whisper, Someone's coming. My friend didn't move. His face had an expression of fear. At some point, my friend bolted up and said, Fuck this. He grabbed his pipe, stuffed it full of pot, and took the biggest, deepest drags I've ever seen a person take. About one or two minutes later, he was out. Drugs aren't my thing, so I was alone in the tent, as far as conscious bodies are concerned. I was sitting up at this point, and I had taken out the only weapon I had, a Swiss Army pocket knife. I took out the big and small blades, as well as had the ice pick in the middle, and held it in like some ridiculous melee weapon. I could see the glowing ambers in the fire pit through the sheer nylon material of our tent and I was able to roughly but barely discern some of the rocks around it. I watched and listened intently. The footsteps came closer and at the same slow pace. With each step I could hear the dirt and rocks underfoot crunching and grinding. At some point it was clear to me that whoever it was was standing between the tent and the fire pit. From my fuzzy line of sight to the burning ambers through the nylon tent became obscured by something outside of the tent. The footsteps stopped right in front of the tent, about 8 inches from the tent, no more than a foot from the entrance of the tent. It was silent for about a minute and then I heard a click. At the exact same time, I saw through the nylon wall of the tent a flashlight turn on. I was able to see not just the flashlight but the outline of the hand holding it. The flashlight was shining on the zipper of the entrance of the tent, just inches away from the zipper. Blood drained from my head, and my palms instantly became dripping with sweat. I yelled, Who's there? There was some fear in my voice, but it was mostly an aggressive tone. Whoever it was, the person immediately turned off their flashlight. I didn't move, but neither did they. The person just stood there inches from the tent entrance. My friend is out totally unaware of what's going on. Nevertheless, I pretended that he was still awake and whispered loud enough to be audible to our visitor. Yes, loaded. One in the chamber. As if my friend was asking me about my gun. Fourth mistake. We didn't have a gun or any real weapon for self-defense. It felt like an eternity, but after sitting there for almost 10 minutes, I heard the feet slowly turn in the dirt, then slowly walk away from the tent. I stayed up the whole night, and it wasn't until the light of day came through the tent that I finally crashed out. The heat inside the tent woke us up, and it was near noon by that point. We went outside to inspect the site, but found nothing missing. However, we did find boot prints leading away from our campsite and outside the campground. That was the last time I camped in a tent. When I was in high school, I was home alone and listening to music loud in my room. 
We have a security system that causes each door or window when open in the house to make a beep beep sound as an alert. For some reason, I thought that it would be funny to joke that someone had broken into my house while I was home alone. I tweeted something along the lines of, Someone just came into my house, followed by just kidding. I don't know what drove me to post something so stupid. It was ridiculous, but I was also 15 years old at the time. A few minutes after that tweet, the song that I was listening to ended and it was silent before the next song started to play. All I heard was, beep beep. It was the front door. I heard it open, but not close. My dog was sitting on the staircase, which led straight up to my room. She was in the view of the door, but I couldn't see her. I heard her growl in a way I had never heard before. At that moment, I just got a gut feeling that something bad was about to happen, so I shut off my music and stayed as quiet as possible. My dad was out of state traveling, and my mom and sister were at the park. I had a gut feeling that it wasn't my mom, so instead of asking if it was her, I texted her, asking if she was home. Right away, she texted me back saying no, but they were at the same park. At that moment, I snuck into my closet and called 911. The operator told me to stay on the phone with her and to stay quiet. The police showed up after what felt like an hour. My mom came home at the same time and they reviewed the security cameras. The cameras would record in sections, if that makes sense. So all they could find on the cameras was a silhouette standing in the front of the door with the light shining in from behind them. Nothing was showing that could identify whoever it was. I have no idea who opened the front door, but it never happened again. So I have had quite a few bad experiences with strange people at my house. From when I was young, an old man would come bang on our door late at night demanding to see me, causing me to have to hide in the house and not being allowed into the garden alone for years. Or when a man came knocking on our door late at night with a knife because he mistook our house for our neighbors. These experiences all caused me to be very cautious when opening the front door to anyone or being alone in the house, especially at night. But one evening was definitely the worst. It was around 6 p.m. in November 2018. I'm from England, meaning it was already pitch black outside at this time of the year. I just got home from work and sat in my room upstairs watching YouTube on my laptop. My mom shouted up to me that she was going to pick up my brother from work and they would be stopping off at the petrol station on the way back. So she would be gone for a little bit and asked if I wanted to come. I said no and carried on with my video. I heard her close the front door and pull out of the driveway. I was 17 at the time. So being home alone at night was nothing new to me and I was used to the eerie feeling of it. After 10 minutes, I start hearing noises coming from downstairs. At first, I thought nothing of it and just related it to my cat nosily searching for food in an empty bowl until I remember him sitting at the end of my bed. I paused the video and listened more at the sound of banging on my door. This instantly creeped me out until it was followed by keys jiggling. And I thought, oh, mom must have just dropped off my brother before going to the petrol station and he's trying to get inside. So I let the noise continue as I was watching my video. He can get quite angry sometimes, so loud banging was not out of the ordinary, but just kept carrying on. The banging sound and the key jiggling, then dropping, then banging again. Then the fear really hit me I don't think it's him. I walked out of my room slowly and sat at the stairs listening carefully to the noise. It definitely wasn't him. I'm a very anxious person and everyone gets those times late at night when they hear noises and immediately thinks the worst. This was just one of those I told myself. So I decided to bite the bullet and just walk straight into the kitchen and face whatever was causing that noise. Our kitchen has a door straight into the garden. But as I turned the corner into the kitchen, I heard a loud bang and clatter of footsteps running away. The cat flap had been ripped off the door and there's plastic pieces from it everywhere. 
in fear, I still try to console myself into thinking that it could be anything other than people trying to break in. I sat back on the stairs and called my mom just to check again that it wasn't my brother home early and just in a bad mood. But then he answered my mom's phone while still in the car. Are you home? I shouted at him. No. Then my voice started to break with terror. Please be serious. Are you at home right now? No. What do you want? Even though he said he wasn't, I still begged in my mind that he was just joking just to get a scare out of me. But he heard how scared I was and began to worry. I explained to him what happened and he started to scream at me to call the police. He's never been the protective type, but I could tell that he was now worried and he told my mom to rush back home straight away. While dialing 999, I tried so hard to calm myself. I told them exactly what happened as I hid in the back room with the door tightly locked. Then I heard talking and the banging of the doors again downstairs. They were back. I burst into tears to the dispatcher out of pure fear and sat on the phone for what felt like ever until my mom, brother, and police pulled up at the same time. Everyone charged through the house to the back door and we instantly saw what they had done. The people saw the keys to the back door on the side of the kitchen, took a broom from outside, broke it in half on the door handle, got the broom through the cat flap, knocked the keys off the side, and pulled them through the cat flap. Although, out of pure luck, as they broke the broom in half, they also managed to snap off the door handle, making it impossible for them to open from the outside. Otherwise, they would have gotten in no questions asked and I would have been sitting in my room quietly, completely oblivious. It was clear afterwards that they had been watching the house for a while, waiting until the exact moment they saw my mom's car pull out of the driveway. I'm not sure if they knew I was in there alone or not, but I know after they initially saw me and ran away, they made the choice to come back. So dickheads who don't know how to open doors properly, let's not meet. My friend Sally has had bad run-ins with the neighbors, but this one was the worst. Sally lives very close to me, about 10 minutes walk. We were both around 14 years old when this happened. We live in a rural area, so we both have a lot of land. Sally and I decided to go camping on our land. We bought cheap hammocks and went through the bushland. The days prior, we spent time clearing some of the razor grass with a cane knife to make a path. We probably should have worn long pants because we ended up with little cuts all over our legs and some of our arms. We set up our hammocks and brought quite a few blankets because it gets pretty cold at night even though we were sweating throughout the day. We were still on our property and hadn't gone into our neighbor's boundary. Her neighbor had just leased the land to new tenants. Sally and I were on our hammocks talking and laughing at around 9 p.m. We heard something in the bush. We thought it was a wallaby. There are plenty of wallabies around here. Then we could see a figure of a man. We were whispering to each other to see who it was. At the time, we thought it was her brother. He came and scared us the last time we were camping. Then the person got closer and we were thinking it could have been her dad. It was dark and the bush looked like the same from every angle. We realized that this guy was coming from the opposite direction of her house. We didn't dare move and covered our torches under our blankets. The man came up and said hi and introduced himself as Ben. Now Ben was extremely drunk. He staggered around and reeked of alcohol. He started saying how we had a little nice camp and said something pretty unsettling. I'll have to come out here and sunbake naked on one of these hammocks. Sally and I gave each other a worried look, but didn't say anything. It got worse from there. I can't remember everything he said because it was a while ago and he was mumbling on for what felt like forever. But some of the things he said that stuck out were, I'll have to kill yous, Wolf Creek style, and said, you're nearly legal then. When he asked us our age, Ben was probably in his 40s. Sally and I were texting each other while he was talking 
and coming up with an escape plan. He also offered us Puff the Magic Dragon and pulled out a glass pipe. We declined. Sally then said that we were leaving back to the house to make food. He told us to come back. We left our blankets and most of our stuff and legged it there. We told her dad what just happened and we slept inside. The next morning we went back to the campsite to find everything burnt. A circle with probably a 20 meter radius was all burnt. Coming from the circle was a line of burnt grass going towards the neighbor's house. I'm not a firefighter or do forensics, but it seemed obviously that some kind of fuel was used. Sally and I were talking and it dawned on us the possibility that Ben, thinking that we were in the hammocks due to the pile of blankets, Ben was definitely drunk enough not to be able to tell the difference. We went and told Sally's dad, who checked it out, then went next door. Ben's roommate answered the door and said that Ben wasn't home and apologized. He gave Sally's dad $50 for the blankets and hammocks. Nothing more happened for a few months. Sally told me at school how Ben had been caught on camera sneaking around her yard. I went to her house after school because she was going to be home alone until her dad finished work. I ended up sleeping over there that night. That's when he came over. Ben was drunk and came out of the front of Sally's house, started yelling and accusing Sally of stealing his dog. Sally's dad called the police. They arrested him. The next day, we found a knife in the yard. It wasn't from Sally's house. The police came again and we told them about the knife and they got the footage from him on camera as well. I don't know what happened to Ben, but he no longer lives next to Sally. So Ben, let's not meet. This is an occurrence that takes me pretty far from the setting of most of my other encounters and finds me in good old Ohio. You see, I was in a hiatus from my life in general at the time, debating on a fresh start in a new corner of the country. I'd been in Ohio before, but only for a short time, and my memories were quite fond. I decided to go back there to see if I still felt the same way about it. I was not employed at the time, but I had a substantial source of income due to the fact that I do tattoo work. It was my tattoo work that allowed me to rent an extended stay motel room for the time being and was unfortunately also the reason this encounter came to pass. I'm going to cover this now to save questions later. I am not a licensed tattoo artist, though that is soon to be changing and I am not licensed at this time in this state. I am, however, a good artist with excellent sanitation practices, as two people in my life are professional licensed artists and taught me everything I know. Back to the story. I got a text from someone who had seen a post about my work. She said her name was Kimberly and that she was interested in getting something done. We talked for a bit and compared schedules, all that fun stuff. We were at odds with our timing and decided that I would meet her at her job to further discuss it and so she could see my portfolio. Kimberly worked at a small deli not far from my motel and I headed over there at the appointed time. It seemed as if it was empty with only one other car in the lot other than mine. I grabbed my equipment and went inside and the little bell dinged. A little small Asian man came out to the counter and asked if he could help me. I said I was looking for Kimberly and explained that I had business with her. He said sure, hold on, and came out into the lobby area of the deli. Then he went over to the front door, pulled out his keys and locked it. It was one of those doors that had no other locking mechanism, only the key. I couldn't have left without the key. It was needed both ways. Then he turned to me and told me that he was Kimberly and told me to sit down. I reached into the pocket for my phone and realized that I had left it in the car. Then I went to the door and tried it anyway, and of course it wouldn't open. The whole time, Kimberly was staring at me with a smile. He told me again to sit down, so I did. I asked him why he locked me in and he says that it was for our safety. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. He looked harmless and we were in a bad part of town. 
He started talking about the tattoo, asking questions. He wanted to know if I could do portrait work, and I explained that I could, and that some of my portrait work was shown in the post where he had gotten my info from. He said he needed seven faces and wanted it to be a whole sleeve. This was beyond the scope of anything we discussed, and I told him it could be done but it would take a while and would have to be more than one session. This seemed to make him uncomfortable. He asked how long and I said, I don't know. It's hard to estimate portrait work as each pick presents its own unique challenges. He asked me how many sessions it would take and I told him ideally one for each phase but I might be able to do two at a time. Then I asked him who were the people if they were family. He didn't answer me right away. He just had a spacey look in his eyes and seemed to stare right through me. After a while he started talking. The first one he wanted he said was a woman he knew in high school. I found it strange the way he said it. Like you don't just get casual acquaintances tattooed on you. You just don't. So I asked why he wanted her tattooed on him. And he told me that this was because she had been his first kill. I just sat there in disbelief. Didn't even know what to say. He started talking again after a few minutes. He said that all of the people he wanted portraits of were people that he killed. He also said he killed more than that, many more, but these were his favorite ones. I didn't know whether or not to believe him, but given the situation, I didn't really want to find out. I asked him why I should tat these people on him when he probably just killed me afterwards too. And he looked legitimately surprised and told me he never even considered it. Odd, especially knowing that I knew where he worked. He went on to tell me some really horrific things about what he's done. Things I won't even repeat here. He gave me names and locations. He was going to give me pictures of the victims for the tattoos. He said that before long he would get caught and he wanted these tats on his arm so he'd never forget those faces while he's in prison. I don't think this man felt that I could be any threat to him. He was so casual about everything, wasn't really even defensive in the least. But I grew up in the hood and done several years in prison so I knew how to handle myself. I didn't really even need to know how as it turned out because I stood up and hit him once and he fell down, seemingly unconscious. I took the keys from him and unlocked the door and ran to my car and left in a hurry. I called the police and reported everything as I drove and this is where it gets really scary. They dispatched officers to the deli and sent one to my motel room so I could file a report on everything. The officer that showed up looked puzzled when I told him where it all happened and asked if I was sure. I said I was and he told me that the deli had been closed for a few weeks now and the owner had disappeared. The owner's family apparently believed that the owner had went to Hawaii for whatever reason. I guess he told them before that he was thinking about it, but he hadn't been in touch so they reported him missing. I told him I was sure and I had proof. I still had the keys to the place. The cop went pale, looked pretty disturbed, but wouldn't say anything more about it. Later on, through means that I can't mention here, I found out a few things that were pretty disturbing to me. One of them was that the owner's family hadn't been able to access the deli at all because it was locked up and they had told the police that the owner had been the only person with the keys. I never heard anything more about it, but I did a little investigating on my own. I searched all the names that he told me and got a few things from it. I can't be certain of these things as they were unrelated to what happened. I got hits on two of the names. The first was a prostitute with several arrests for prostitution. The arrests weren't in the area, but hadn't been too far away either. The second was a similar story about drug charges, but no prostitution. And like the other, she wasn't in the area, but wasn't far off either. No hits for the other missing people under those names at all but a prostitute might not have anyone who would report the missing. Same with a narcotics woman. That, or the people who would possibly report assumed that she was on a using binge somewhere and neglected to report her missing. I found out nothing at all about the rest. 
I don't know what to believe about this, but I lean towards the possibility that this guy was dead serious. His demeanor, the vacant stare in his eyes, him locking up the deli, his behavior practically screamed that something was wrong. I left Ohio very shortly after that and went home. I haven't been back since. I forgot to mention that the police found the deli empty, but it was now suddenly unlocked. Okay, this might not be as scary to others as it was for someone who was in the situation. This is a recent and still ongoing story. I'll use different names for the sake of the story. Imagine a 5'4", average weight 16 year old girl. That's me, Lily. Now imagine a 27 year old tall, muscular guy. That's Jace, also known as my half brother. It all started when my mom got a phone call and Jace saying he had lost his home. He said he didn't eat every day. So my mother obviously wanted her kid home. So she asked my dad and he let him move in. All was good because I stayed away due to not liking to be around strangers. I had not been raised with him and knew nothing about him. So I never talked to him. I finally did and God was that a mistake. He began to make comments about how sexy I was and how I could please him. I was repulsed. He's on drugs and crazy, so I thought he was just joking because he is known to say stupid stuff as jokes. Well, I quickly learned he wasn't. He repeatedly talked to me in sexual ways and would look me up and down whenever I was near. It made me highly uncomfortable. I text Jace on Facebook saying it was fucking weird that he needed to stop and that he was making me feel uncomfortable. He agreed to that and apologized. End of the story, right? No, that would be too easy. He stopped for a couple days, then continued like normal. I turned 17 a little later. I'm still 17 right now. He had uncontrollable anger and was awful to my siblings and me. My dad didn't and doesn't know. My mother is crazy and doesn't do anything. She just watches us suffer. She has heard the things he said to me and has said nothing. There's so much more, but I'll keep on with the basics. One night set the terror in me. I woke up in the dark to Jace close to me. My lock on my door was broken, so it has a chain that he was able to unhook from the outside. I jumped up, shoved him off, and yelled at him. He admits his feelings were real, and he knew he was fucked up. I told him if he ever did anything like that again, I would tell my dad. I've slept with a knife ever since then, but my knife was stolen. Jace is a kleptomaniac, meaning he's obsessed with stealing stuff, but that's another story for another time. For unrelated reasons, I went and stayed with my sister for two weeks, so he never said anything because I have blocked him on Facebook now. I come home and he's being rude as usual, has my little sister terrified that he's going to kill her or something. I don't know what the fuck to do. You don't mess with my little siblings. I asked my older sister to come with me to tell my dad everything tomorrow. Because last time I didn't tell my dad something important. He yelled at me and I have bad anxiety and bipolar. So I try to avoid confrontations at all cost. But it's been going on for too long. I'm not going to give him a warning either. Jace needs something done. It's around 3.30 in the morning and I have scissors next to me just in case something happens again. Yeah, it's that bad. I know it was dumb to wait for so long. I know that I'm doing the right thing telling my dad, but I know my mother will deep down hate me. But at this point, she can go fuck herself too. Remember guys, never wait to report or do something, no matter how scary it is. The story happened when I was in college. There was something about my early years in college that just seemed to bring on a slew of experiences that ranged from creepy to terrifying. I don't know what it was about that time in my life. This experience was somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Anyway, 
One night at the beginning of summer, following my freshman year of college, some of my high school friends and I were at a party. We hadn't seen a ton of each other in the preceding year because of us all being away at college, mostly just during school breaks and a few random weekends here and there. So we were all feeling kind of giddy about having the whole summer together. I wouldn't have normally gone to this party hosted by someone else we went to high school with. But they all wanted to go, and I wanted to hang out with them, so I agreed. This is not the mistake I made in the story. That would come later on that night. We got to the party, and we realized it was almost exclusively people from high school, which was kind of nice actually. It was like a big reunion. Soon my prior inhibitions were gone, and that was only partially because I started throwing back screwdrivers the moment I got there. A couple hours later, I was more than a little tipsy. No, I was full on drunk, though not totally plastered yet, which proved to be my saving grace in the story. After a while, a group of my friends decided to split off. The host of the party, Stephanie, lived in her parents house still, and it was in the middle of nowhere, basically near a forest. Forest at night both scare and thrill me, so drunk me suggests that we go exploring. This is something my friends would not let me live down, like not ever. So anyway, this group, Lauren, Hillary, Jared, Alex, Hugo, Dean, and the host of Stephanie, plus myself obviously, decided to go on a midnight walk through the woods. It was pretty creepy, not gonna lie, but in a cool way, at least I thought so. A couple people in the group, namely Hillary and Alex, were pretty afraid but Hillary wanted to go because her best friend was Lauren, and Alex had a thing for Hillary and Lauren, which was a whole thing and not the point of the story. But because of that, they were both there. They kept making comments about how creeped out they were, and I kept telling them to relax. No one else is out here, I told them. Let's just enjoy this time together. Being drunk makes me really sentimental. We walked through the forest for a bit, and then came up to a clearing with a lake and a dock with tall grass and shit, plus a shed and what turned out to be a boathouse, both of which had seen better days. Now, Stephanie and I weren't close, so this was my first time exploring this forest, but Dean and Hugo had before and remembered this place. They mentioned that they thought Stephanie's parents forbid them from coming back there because it wasn't their property, which was true. It was like suddenly, Stephanie realized where we were. I wasn't the only drunk one. And her eyes got super wide and she looked nervous. Not scared exactly, more like she was worried that she was gonna get in trouble and she said that we should go back. I told her everything was fine since she could totally trust the judgment of a drunk person and because everyone else was drunk. They all agreed with me. Except for Steph, but she was outnumbered and not about to go back alone. Even Hillary and Alex were okay with staying. And because logic is a friend to drunk people everywhere, I suggest we play hide and seek. And most everyone agreed. Honestly, I don't know why people kept listening to me. Now if I had been sober, this was the kind of place I'd be kind of freaked out about. In a cool way, sure. But not in a let's play hide and seek kind of way. This is where things go wrong. Hugo was forced to be it because we were all assholes and told him he didn't have a choice. So he we went into the woods and counted while we all ran and hide. I saw Dean dart into the shed, but everyone else ran into the woods. I decided to duck down in the tall grass, which varied in height. Sometimes I could kneel and sometimes I had to be on my stomach to be totally concealed. As I was hiding, I heard voices in the trees nearby. Whispers, like the speakers were trying not to be heard. I was curious, so I made my way towards the voices, first on my hands and knees and eventually army crawling as the grass got shorter. I nearly shit my pants when I ran into Stephanie in the grass, who turned out to be doing the same exact thing as me. When we got closer, we realized it was Lauren and Jared. And that was how Steph and I realized they liked each other. We were listening to them flirt and looking at each other. And I swear we had a telepathic conversation about how good they would be together. 
but that was when we heard someone barreling towards us through the grass. Heart pounding, I turned to see that it was just Hugo throwing himself down next to Stephanie and me, and he looked terrified. Hugo, what the fuck? I whispered because there's no way he counted as high as we were making him. We were being real jerks to Hugo that night. He looked around frantically and then told us what had him spooked. I'll never forget the sheer terror I saw in Hugo's face and heard in his voice, there's someone in the woods. Stephanie tried to tell him that it was probably just someone else from the party, but Hugo said no. He'd seen a guy and hid behind a tree and this guy seemed to be in his 40s and he said the guy looked rough too and just had a bad feeling so he booked it. It was just by chance that he found Stephanie and me. He's looking for something or someone, Hugo said, telling us that the guy was shining a flashlight around. As if on cue, someone came walking out of the woods and then called out, Jim, are you out here? He sounded kind of angry and now I felt stone cold sober. This wasn't right and it was about to get worse because that's when we saw the shadow of someone rowing a boat down the lake towards the dock. The first guy walked out to the dock to meet the guy, Jim presumably, and I heard him demand, where is he? The first guy sounded angry, like he was expecting someone else to be there too. And the second guy informed the first, I fucked up. They proceeded to argue, though I couldn't hear what they were saying. Then they went into the boathouse. I'm pretty sure no one had hidden in there, but I had worried about that. Plus the fact that two shifty guys were doing what seemed to be pretty shifty things. We needed to get out of there. I knew that, but Dean was still in the shed, which was too close to the boathouse for comfort, given the situation. Lauren and Jared were now making out and totally oblivious and Hillary and Alex were fuck knows where. Why had I suggested hide and seek? That's what I kept asking myself when I tried to formulate a plan. Then we heard somebody running through the woods, but like they were trying to do it so quietly. I turned to see Hillary. It looked like she was trying to find somewhere else to hide, unaware of what was happening. I saw her run towards the boathouse. It was like time stopped. I didn't know what to do or how to stop her. Honestly, I froze, but then Hillary hesitated when she got close to the door. She would later tell us that the voices she heard inside gave her pause. And then the door swung open. It was like something out of a movie. Hillary was now hiding behind the open door and the first guy stood in the doorway looking around. I think he must have heard Hillary, who was not being nearly as quiet as she thought she was. If he closed the door from the outside, he'd see Hillary, and then we'd all be truly fucked. Luckily, he went back inside and closed the door. We had to get the hell out of there, but we still had to get Dean, Lauren, and Jared, as well as find Alex. We didn't have a lot of time, I didn't think, so we had to be fast. Then suddenly, Hugo stood up, cupped his hands around his mouth, and bellowed. <coughs> he apparently thought we were in a movie. I just looked at him with a, what the fuck Hugo? expression on my face. It was not what I would have done, but I'll be damned, it worked. Hillary came sprinting towards us, as did Alex, who was hiding behind the boathouse. Likewise, Dean emerged from the shed and Lauren and Jared detached themselves from each other. The two men in the boathouse heard us too and came busting out, but by this point we were all sprinting away. I swear, I never before nor since ran that fast. At one point Stephanie tripped and I practically ripped her arm out of the socket while pulling her to her feet. The guys chased us for a bit, though I don't know how long because we kept running until we got back to Stephanie's house. The party was still going and the men hadn't followed us beyond the woods, but we were all too freaked out to stay. I called my brother to come pick us up and we all left, even Stephanie who left her house unattended except for all the drunk party goers. We spent the night at my brother's house that night and we went back to Stephanie's house to help clean up the next day because honestly, this experience kind of bonded us in a way. Lauren and Jared are now married Hillary and Alex were both in the wedding. 
I lived with Dean for a bit following college, and Hugo is one of my best friends, as is Stephanie. Which is weird because we weren't really friends before that. But I swear, we thought we were going to die that night. All of us, except maybe Lauren and Jared. Even Dean heard what was happening outside the shed and was waiting for the right time to make his escape. You can't go through something like that and not come out closer. It's strange, but also kind of nice. Like we have this shared history, which was true before this because we all went to school together, but it's different now. I wanted to go back and investigate in the light of day, but only Dean wanted to go with me and I thought maybe it wasn't enough people. I was still pretty spooked, though intrigued. Stephanie told us later that she had told her dad when her parents got home that day, and he and a few of his friends went back there and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. They moved shortly thereafter, not because of this, so we never found out what happened, but we've also never forgotten it. 